Good morning. Welcome to the Budget Committee. Uh, I'm going to go through a couple of things here before we start. Any member of the public wishing to speak further regarding an issue on the 2018 Budget Committee agenda for today may appear before Council at its meeting on December 18, 2017 at 7 p.m. when the recommendations from this meeting will go forward for final consideration. If you wish to speak as a delegation, please sign the sheet located at the back of the room or notify the Clerk's Department no later than noon the day of the Council meeting. Any PowerPoint presentations must also be forwarded to the Clerk's Department no later than noon the day of the meeting. I see no regrets from members of the committee. Are there any pecuniary interests to be declared? I see none. Uh, we have a fairly full agenda this morning. Uh, we've got a number of presentations from each of the commissions and we'll be going through the material that's associated with each of the reports in the agenda as part of those presentations. Um, is there anything else that anybody would like to bring up at this point? Okay. Then Welcome, and we look forward to the Community Services Commission presentation. Is it coming up on the screen? Okay. We need to get the presentation on the overhead. It's up now. Oh, there we are. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm very pleased to present the uh, budget for the Community Services Commission for 2018. Uh, the slide here shows all of the uh, services that are encompassed within the Community Services Commission and it also identifies the tabs in which you can find uh, greater budget detail for each of the areas. For the 2017 accomplishments, uh, our theme song for uh, 2017 was Rising uh, High Water Blues. Uh, we had uh, the worst flood since 1912. Uh, which required uh, a very large uh, interdepartmental response, uh, it, which lasted for several months. The flood started at the end of April, and only now are the waters truly receding, and we can see the level of damage that's actually taken place along the shoreline and in our lakefront parks. Uh, we will be uh, actually bringing a report forward uh, in the new year once we've got the detailed assessment from our shoreline engineers. Uh, one of the highlights of, of managing that particular flood was that we uh, made much better use of data analytics. We uh, actually began to use uh, service Oakville data and tracked it uh, via our GIS mapping. We were also able to do modeling to predict uh, different water levels and what the impact would be on adjacent properties. So we intend to uh, build on that experience in coming years because we do anticipate that there will pro probably be uh, future flooding problems and this is not going to be a century uh, occurrence. For the townwide EAB hazard uh, abatement program, uh, we focused in two uh, key areas. Uh, as you will probably have witnessed in your neighborhoods, we have been removing um, ha dead and hazardous uh, ash trees in, in our woodlots, but we have also uh, put a huge emphasis on our tree planting program so that we are uh, replenishing our tree canopy. We updated our private tree bylaw, which took effect May 1st, and uh, early results show that uh, our, the number of requests for private tree removals is down by 73% since uh, May 1st, and also the number of uh, trees being deemed high risk by private arborists has gone down by 88%. We introduced 72 new garden plots at the Memorial Park, including uh, some accessible ones, so that everyone in the community has the opportunity to experience uh, that pleasure. We started our design work in consultation with uh, the local community and particularly our very engaged uh, residents associations for Southeast Community Centre, and that's progressing quite beautifully. We, uh, our Roads and Works team, along with other teams, uh, provided stellar support once again for the Canadian Open Tournament, and our Recreation and Culture team created the first new, uh, new community development plan, which will focus specifically uh, on dealing with changing demographics, uh, de uh, changing cultural interests, and also growth, particularly in North Oakville. And the last one uh, on this slide is a particularly interesting one. We have a partnership with uh, Enveronics and uh, several departments which included Service Oakville, Recreation and Culture, Library, Bylaw, uh, Development, Engineering and Fire 
uh, gathered all of their data sets and we began to uh, have uh, Enveronix create neighborhood profiles and also uh, which would help us in terms of customizing our, our uh, public engagement uh, strategies going forward, looking at uh, different ways we can customize programming by neighborhood as well, and also look at initiatives where we're cross-referencing um, things like false alarms in a particular neighborhood and uh, working in partnership with libraries and recreation and culture as well. So uh, Enveronix is very excited. This is the first time they've done that with any municipality. Uh, Transit launched their a new tra uh, demand response scheduling software for our, our riders who use uh, specialized transit. That's being extremely well received. Uh, we are recognizing that the, imp the impact of AODA legislation is having a profound effect on the transit budget, particularly in specialized transit because the eligibility criteria for specialized transit has broadened the, this year, so we have a much higher demand. So in response to that, uh, we have taken uh, the opportunity to do a strategic review of specialized transit services to look at ways that we can um, actually establish greater cost containment measures uh, while using creative means by which we can still deliver the service uh, to the community in the manner in which they need. And we will be um, providing uh, the recommendations from that in the new year. We also uh, installed onboard video surveillance cameras uh, in our, all our buses to ensure safety for both our drivers and our passengers. There have been some incidents over the past few years and um, the cameras have been very well received by both parties, which I'm very pleased about. Uh, bus infrastructure upgrades, uh, primarily in the area of um, bus shelters, so we have uh, replaced 26 bus shelters, added 22 bus shelters, and installed solar energy in 28 bus shelters. And we have initiated a cemeteries master plan. Um, and the purpose of this master plan is to identify options on how the cemeteries group and the operation bec can become more sustainable over the longer term. Uh, the library uh, had probably its most innovative year in the history of the OPL. They uh, launched their new uh, OPL strategic plan, which has a very specific focus on digital transformation and the whole transformation of the, the library system in general to set the stage for uh, the library as a key community hub going forward. They opened their first creation zone at Iroquois Ridge uh, Library in July. It was incredibly well received the first weekend. Uh, I think it was something in the neighborhood of 1,500 people uh, just casually showed up and, and wanted to see what the uh, zone was all about. So it has been very well received. Uh, they also implemented RFID technology in all of their branches. And this has led to uh, being able to provide self-serve checkout for uh, all patrons. It has also allowed the library to, as a result, the library has now been able to examine its operating model in the branches, and they've been able to consolidate to a one-desk model, which is actually a lot more effective from a one-stop shopping perspective for patrons who attend. And also, uh, because of the data that they are now generating from the RFID technology, they were able to do very strategic analysis of footfall traffic in all of their branches, and they have been able to adjust operating hours to reflect the volumes that are going into particular branches. So that will be happening in 2018, but it's been done in a very thoughtful and analytical way, so we're really pleased to see that as well. And finally, from the library side, they introduced a new seed library, which has also been very well received by the public as well. Uh, on the fire side, they um, introduced new fire data analytics software. Um, progressive fire departments are moving very strongly into the data analytics area. The kinds of things that they are looking at are things like um, looking at the nature of service calls and tailoring their uh, training programs to reflect those uh, service calls. And also they're looking at uh, data analytics to inform um, how they do fire prevention going forward as well, which is a, a very exciting area. 
They've also, in response to uh, the recent pr provincial legislation, they've moved very strongly uh, to implement a very effective PTSD prevention plan, um, working closely with other Halton area fire departments to establish uh, peer support groups. So we're very pleased that uh, we've moved so strongly in that particular area. Uh, Roads and Works has been very busy, as, uh, as some of you have noted, on phase two of the LED uh, street light conversion, that's specifically the decorative um, street light uh, pieces, and that they should be on time for this year, so we're very pleased about that. And Recreation and Culture also introduced an e-notification for program wait lists. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but our recreation and culture programs are immensely popular. On average, we have at least 2,000 people on our wait list, and uh, we anticipate that that will become an even bigger issue as uh, growth happens in North Oakville. So we need a way to be able to manage um, those wait lists. So uh, this has been very well received by our residents. Uh, key program uh, outcomes. So for roads and works, uh, the top two are minimum maintenance standard deficiencies per lane kilometer, and as you can see, they have held steady uh, for the last five years. Uh, they have improved uh, to 88% from 68% uh, in terms of the number of uh, respondents who are satisfied with winter uh, road and sidewalk maintenance, and that can be attributed to two factors. One, we have an extraordinary uh, winter control crew who do outstanding work each and every year, but also Mother Nature has cooperated with uh, slightly milder winters in the last couple of years. The library has held steady in terms of the number of card holders that they have per capita. Um, there's been very little variation. The interesting KPI for the library is the split between uh, traditional print uh, materials and digital materials in their overall collection. Um, as you can see in 2013, it was 21% for digital and 79% for print. But in 2017, uh, digital has moved up to 31, and that can be attributed to broader availability of digital products, and the prices are starting to come down slightly because when digital was first introduced, the costs were prohibitively expensive. Transit ridership has uh, moving uh, very steadily back towards the 2014 uh, all-time high of 3 million riders. Uh, unfortunately, this year, I think we would have met that uh, particular target had we not had the Sheridan College strike that uh, seems to have lasted till the end of time. Um, but now they're back on board, so hopefully uh, we will be able to make up the difference. But the Sheridan uh, College ridership was a huge hit because it accounts for 5% of the overall ridership. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've also been able to uh, measure uh, electronically what our transit on time performance has been. And as you can see between 2016 and 17, and that's through our ITS technology, uh, the on time performance has risen to 84%. Uh, for fire, the two key areas is the, pre the percentage of response crew travel time, 240 seconds or less for the first four firefighters on the scene. Um, this has dropped from 2013 from 80% to 66% in 2017. And there are two key factors that uh, have impacted that. Uh, rising uh, traffic congestion uh, from intensification and growth and also uh, from the number of construction projects that are happening around the town, and we don't anticipate that the number of projects is going to reduce anytime soon. Recreation participate, participant hours, as you can see, have risen dramatically from 2013 to 2017, uh, culminating in 770 or 765,000. Um, the uh, big areas of growth for recreation have been primarily in aquatics and our summer camps. Uh, I think if we added, uh, if we doubled the number of summer camps that we had, we would be able to fill them in absolutely no time. They are incredibly popular. And our capacity rates for our, all of our programs have gone up from 74% to 80%. Parks added three kilometers of uh, trail to our already extensive, beautiful trail system. And the number of trees and shrubs that we have planted for 2017 is 30,096, which all contributes to the improvement of our tree canopy. Our key initiatives in 2018, uh, under outstanding uh, service to the public, uh, we are concerned about um, considering, 
uh, continuing, continuing risk for uh, flood. So we are going to go into a lot more detail around a, a broader town flood response plan using the historical analytics that uh, we were able to create in this year. Uh, transit, uh, using, uh, strategically using gas tax dollars, has been able to extend uh, Route 1 to Trafalgar uh, to 407 Park and Ride. We are expanding uh, home to hub in four key areas after 8 o'clock at night. So that will be Falgerwood, Southeast Oakville, Clearview, east of Trafalgar and north of 16 Mile. And we're able to do service improvements on routes 4, 5 and 6. We will be initiating uh, construction for Fire Hall number 8, uh, which we're very excited about. That's long overdue. And in the area of innovation, Roads and Works is going to be introducing a new salt management plan, and they are automating, uh, introducing automation of their hours of service tracking system for vehicles and equipment operators, and this will inform uh, maintenance schedules and uh, retrofits. Uh, Part, uh, recreation and culture uh, will be continuing to look at uh, class replacement. We are going to need to do that at some point very soon and it will impact a number of departments. However, what we have been doing is looking at uh, what other municipalities have been doing and the lessons learned uh, that they have undertaken so that uh, we know the direction we want to go in. And FIRE is going to be implementing a fire prevention mobile app um, this is extremely important because uh, it will create time efficiencies uh, within that particular team, which will then lead to cost containment over the next few years. Uh, from a, enhancing our natural environment, uh, Parks and Open Space is going to be developing an urban forest strategic management plan. And in response to Bill 73, they are going to be undertaking a new Parks and Open Space strategy, and we're doing that in consultation with both finance and our planning department. We will be completing the cemetery's master plan and bringing forward those recommendations uh, to you later in 2018. Uh, we will be completing the harbor's master plan. Uh, there have been a number of delays with respect to this plan, uh, primarily due to unanticipated opportunities. So we will be finishing the OIS negotiations uh, fairly soon. And uh, hopefully we will be able to complete the outer Bronte Outer Harbor uh, Marina Group negotiations and we will be able to incorporate the outcomes of those two negotiations into the final plan and then present it to Council. Uh, finally, we are starting construction on waterfront trail improvement. Uh, we experienced a number of delays getting permits due to the apparent presence of the American eel. That issue has been resolved, so we will now be proceeding. Um, so I think the community uh, in that area will be uh, very pleased to see the start of that. Trafalgar Park facility will be opening in the fall of 2018. We will continue work uh, for the Southeast Oakville Community Center. Uh, Roads and Works will continue their stellar support for Canadian Open at Glen Abbey Golf Club uh, in 2018. Recreation and Culture is going to be introducing a, park, uh, a public art strategy and the, the, the uh, feasibility studies for both the theater and the central library will be completed next year, and the recommendations coming out of those studies will help inform the direction that council may want to uh, go in with respect to the downtown cultural hub. And finally, uh, with the help of our, our federal friends, uh, we will be able to introduce a new community kitchen at uh, QEP that will double as an instructional kitchen, but also will be part of an evacuation center uh, in the event of an emergency. For uh, community services tax levy, the three biggest uh, areas uh, or departments are uh, emergency services has uh, moved up to 36 million. Infrastructure uh, maintenance has moved up to 22 million and transit in third place has stayed steady at 22 million, which is um, the same as 2017. I have three uh, areas that I wanted to, departments I wanted to focus on um, a little more specifically, and that's around uh, fire department is uh, first. As you can see, contractual wage increases and adjustments are the prim one of the primary drivers for their budget going forward, and also um, vehicle maintenance has also been a huge issue. Uh, the other uh, thing that I did wanted to uh, highlight 
is that we are actually now uh, in a position where, because of an agreement that we have now signed with MTO, we are now um, able to do cost recovery for calls uh, that we respond to on public highways. So we are starting to generate revenue from that and we anticipate that that revenue will grow. On recreation, recreation of all my departments has probably had the toughest uh, go uh, in terms of um, uh, building a budget for 2018. There were three key factors that impacted them. Um, the first one was the uh, impact of minimum wage going from $11.40 up to $14. And uh, that issue is going to continue into 2019. When we did our first cut of uh, the budget, it, the initial impact was $875,000, but because uh, recreation and culture work so closely with both finance and human resources, we were able to bring that number and impact down to $706,000. The second area was uh, service level changes. Um, as you saw in our earlier KPIs, uh, our growth in particularly in aquatics and um, uh, summer camps uh, has been somewhat unprecedented. Um, this has impacted our part-time hours, so we have had to make a significant adjustment to that. And uh, also our utilities all increased. Uh, for example, with hydro over the last four years, hydro has experienced a 30% increase in terms of cost. So um, given all of these circumstances, we did not uh, uh, want to rest on our laurels um, because it, particularly the service level area is, is going to be problematic if we don't do something about it. So for 2018 and I believe 19, we are going to um, use tax stabilization to address the um, service level change. Uh, and then what we are going to do in the meantime is we are going to be undertaking um, three major reviews. The first review is of the overall um, uh, recreation program area, which will be done in 2018 to look for potential cost efficiencies and different ways of doing business. And then we're going to do a deeper dive in uh, the beginning of 2019, and that's around the operating model, and also um, to take a second hard look at our fitness membership um, component and whether or not we want to stay in the business and if we do, what's the model that we, we want to do going forward. For transit, uh, the couple of key areas uh, for um, when we first put together the five-year transit uh, service plan back in 2014, it was built on uh, some key assumptions. And one of the key assumptions was that the ridership levels would stay static. Uh, and then from there, we would build uh, in terms of growth. What ended up happening was that in the several months uh, before we actually implemented the transit service plan, the ridership right across the GTA and nationally, but also including Oakville, began to drop. We did not make adjustments uh, to the revenue in the short term uh, projections because we thought that uh, the drop would be a very short term uh, issue and then we would be able to uh, establish growth again. The drop took longer than we anticipated. We are now moving out. We have been moving out of that uh, drop since we implemented the service plan. So the ridership is now going up, but it has not been meeting the original targets. So we have been meet, uh, we made adjustments to reflect that. The uh, things that Barry has been able to do, and along with the transit team as a mitigation strategy, there are three uh, pieces to that. First, uh, we put in uh, a fare increase, which uh, a number of transit authorities are doing across the GTA. The second is that we did a significant uh, mitigation piece to do cost containment and cost reduction within our uh, transit budget. We, because of the ITS technology that we now have, we're able to do very precise segmentation analysis of each and every route by time of day and the number of passengers that are actually onboarding and offboard, offboarding. And as a result, we were able to come up with a different solution that still provides service to uh, riders in certain areas without um, act actually compromising the budget. And we were able to save about 675000 And the third one was that we were able to um, mitigate with gas tax money as well. 
Our gross operating budget, as you can see, is 176, uh, $176 million, and our net operating is $123 million. The gross operating uh, is uh, the three main areas that drive uh, our budgets in community services is personnel and benefits, which accounts for 60%, internal expenses and transfers, which is 13%, and purchase services, which is also a 13%. In terms of the gross operating budget, uh, the three biggest areas uh, that saw increase was uh, emergency services at 20%, uh, recreation and culture at 20%, and uh, infrastructure maintenance at 19%. Uh, the net operating budget, the three biggest areas was emergency services at 29, uh, infrastructure maintenance at 18, and Oakville Transit at 17. Looking to the future, uh, the impact, uh, there's five areas for us. Uh, the first one is the impact of new legislation. Uh, the first one is there is uh, going to be uh, new uh, changes made to the Ambulance Act, which will enable the, the possibility of the fire medic model and the associated costs. So we are going to be monitoring that very closely. Uh, the minimum wage increases will continue to have significant impact in two key areas, which is primarily uh, recreation and culture, but also parks and open space. Um, also, one of the areas uh, that uh, we are looking at, not so much from a financial side, but certainly an operating side, is the whole issue around uh, the number of days that uh, someone can be off sick before a doctor's note is required, because it will impact um, specific teams that um, have prescribed minimum resource standards, such as um, fire services. So we're going to be looking at that one very closely. Um, we are also uh, looking at proposals right now. Uh, the province is proposing changes to road maintenance standards, um, particularly winter control for bike lanes. Uh, that has not been uh, formally introduced that we're aware of, but there's certainly a lot of discussion around that. So we're watching that one very closely, and also the impact of Bill 73. Uh, there are new requirements that uh, parks uh, need to have more detailed um, strategies in place. We have been able to mitigate um, some of the uh, requirements for that through our recent master plan. If you will uh, remember, the master plan was a lot more detailed around um, urban parks and, and strata parks and some of the new ways that we can approach um, uh, park de development, so we're looking at that one very closely. External factors right across the commission are things like uh, fuel and utility costs, uh, ongoing contractual obligations. For transit in particular, we uh, are watching the uh, impact of the regional transportation plan for Metrolinx very closely. It has uh, really serious uh, impacts in two areas. Uh, when they bring in RER, there may be very strong expectations from the province that the local transit has full integration with RER and other uh, regional transit initiatives, which would have um, significant cost implications for us. And also, uh, the way that the tra uh, Metrolinx will implement fare integration uh, in terms of how they might harmonize cross-boundary uh, policy and the direction that they might want to go in with respect to governance around fair integration. So those, those are key areas that we want to look at. From uh, the impact of technology, there's both challenges and opportunities. The challenge is really the uh, class replacement. The opportunities are we are discovering um, through the uh, strategic investment that Council has made in technology and virtually all of our departments, we are now harvesting data which is making a, a significant difference in the way we do decision making and the way that we are uh, doing our, are actually conducting our operations. And we are looking for ways to leverage that even further so that we can maximize the opportunities that arise from that. Service delivery challenges um, for the library and recreation and culture in particular, there is a lot of pressure uh, for them to be providing more programming around digital literacy. Uh, when we opened the uh, creation zone at Iroquois Ridge, we had huge numbers of parents who uh, came to that facility wanting to know when we could start providing coding uh, courses for uh, toddlers. 
So uh, th there's a whole untapped market around digital uh, uh, literacy that we know is going to be uh, coming at us. Um, under the people plan, uh, one of the big areas obviously is the unionization of the, the library work environment, but also we're looking at um, issues uh, such as succession planning, leadership development, and also um, skill shortages. Again, uh, as per last year, we have two key areas, which is in the arborist area and uh, uh, specialized mechanics. There are five council reports and referrals uh, for your consideration today. The first one is the fire master plan, and that's uh, really what the financial impacts are going to be over uh, the next five years for uh, the budget process. Um, the event strategy implementation update, the recommendation there is, is basically that what we would like to do is we would like to, to ensure continuity for 2018 for our community groups. We are proposing that we continue with a full-time contract person to assist uh, the current special events coordinator so that um, we can then take the opportunity to look at more sustainable uh, options so that we can bring in extra um, resources for special events. Special events is an area of extreme growth. I, I was remiss uh, in terms of the accomplishments of 2017. Our special events team has done an outstanding job. The, it's been unprecedented in the number of uh, events that uh, she has supported. It's over 400. And I would be very remiss if I didn't mention uh, the great work that they did to uh, support the uh, Santa Claus Committee and the parade. It was an outstanding effort. And I hope you all enjoy hometown hockey in downtown Oakville, which was also supported by special events. Uh, cultural plan implementation, that one's a, a very straightforward one. It's simply a recommendation to increase the cultural grants by $25,000. Um, we also have a referral for gypsy moth and canker worm. Uh, we have an infestation in southeast Oakville uh, that needs to be addressed, so we're recommending a one-time capital request of $206,000. Um, I know that the southeast Oakville residents will be extremely grateful if that were to be approved. And the Canadian Open Support, uh, which is our standard report and request that comes forward each time that we support the Canadian Open at Glen Abbey. In terms of our capital budget, this is our top 10. There's uh, two uh, uh, projects that I would like to highlight because there's interdependencies. Uh, in light of the, how successful Iroquois Ridge uh, creation zone uh, has been, we are going to be introducing a second one at Glen Abbey. Glen Abbey is the, the, larger, the, most, uh, the highest volume of all of the uh, libraries in our system. So there will be challenges uh, when we close Glen Abbey for five months. Uh, in addition to that, there is an incredible amount of pressure to put library services somewhere in, north, in the North Park neighborhood. So we are introducing a 5,000 square foot temporary library uh, on North Park, which will help address some of the uh, pressures that will come from the Glen Abbey closure. It will establish a presence in that particular neighborhood. And that's gonna be a blended model because we are also going to uh, be working in partnership with recreation and culture and where recreation and culture is going to be providing youth services in that facility when the library is not in operation. And that's the first model of its kind. So we're really looking forward to what the results will be from that. For the 2018 capital budget by program, uh, our obviously recreation and culture uh, is the largest at 27%, uh, followed by parks and open space and the Oakville Public Library. And I think this is a, a really wonderful uh, community investment in making Oakville an even better place to live and work. In terms of the 2018 budget by category, uh, community enhancements, uh, the two big projects out of that are Trafalgar uh, Park and Southeast Oakville. Infrastructure renewal is, is really a replacement for vehicles for fire uh, parks and roads. Uh, growth is um, things like the neighborhood park in North Oakville and also buying land uh, for Station 9 and uh, for a new library on the Trafalgar North Corridor. 
Uh, strategic priorities are EAB and uh, the Glen Abbey uh, creation zone. And the enterprise uh, initiatives are two main ones, which is the proposed replacement of docks for the Brontiado Harbor and also uh, shoreline uh, replace, uh, restoration in Oakville Harbor. And that is all I have. Any questions? So we'll take questions, Councillor Elgar. Thank you very much for the, the, the presentation. It's appreciated. I guess one of the things when you're presenting kind of jumped out at me, and it has to do with the fire response time. <laughs> and, and my question on that is, do the fire trucks have dash cams? Because yesterday I witnessed um, a fire truck with the siren on trying to go west and turn south onto uh, Trafalgar Road. There was a car in the lane. The person refused to move. They honked the horn. They honked the horn. It, it was. It was. It was. It lasted for far too long, like in an emergency response. And I'm wondering, do we have dash cams that we could at least send videos like that to the police so they could write a letter to the license plate owner of the vehicle? Uh, we don't at this time, but we could certainly uh, take a look at that. I've seen the same thing myself, where I've seen fire trucks coming down Trafalgar and and. People are either not moving at all or very slow to move. It's really problematic. It was, it was, it's more than problematic. I think it's a, an issue that we have mm -hmm. to address because in an emergency situation, it could be life or death. And it, we all know the fire truck is often the first to arrive on the scene of anything. So I, I, would, uh, at the, I would ask that we put mm -hmm. enough money in the budget. They're not expensive to do that and put it in every fire truck so that the firemen themselves can, without having to get out of the truck and tell the person to move, um, get something in place with our uh, Halton Regional Police to do something in that area. We will certainly look into that. Thank you. Um, regard pickleball, are we doing anything about increasing the, the pickleball facilities in, uh, this, in the 2018 budget? We are indeed. So we're uh, looking at uh, doing some conversions. Uh, probably, I think it's about four, Jane, four. Uh, pickleball is, has become extremely popular and, and I have to say the pickleball advocates are very enthusiastic. <laughs> so we're moving as quickly as we can to ensure that, that we're expanding that area and that was identified as the fastest growing sport in our master plan. I, I appreciate that because I've been getting a few phone calls on, on, on that. So I, I, know you're, I know you've been working on it. So I'd never, I've never experienced it myself so I didn't realize how fast it was a, a, as a growing sport. Um, I'd also like to know how much we are currently subsidizing public transit. It is a huge amount of money, but I know it, it, what we have in the budget, like what we're uh, we collecting from the, from the toll box. If, I don't need it today, but it'd be good to have the percentage. We'll report back on that, uh, Councillor, yes. uh, because our cost ratios have been changing in the last year because of the improvement in growth, so I, I will get that information for you. Okay, I would appreciate that. Tree planting standards. Um, are we ourselves, when we replace trees, doing them with our new tree, uh, tree planting standards? Because I had phone calls about right. planting them up in a 16-mile recreation complex. They said they had to replace, like, I don't know, 60 trees. And they said all they saw was a few guys with shovels putting them back in the clay. So, and, I, and I'm just wondering if, if we're doing just to put them in with a shovel or if we're making the proper earth. Just one moment. In short, yes. Okay, that's, that's good to hear. I can get back to LED street lights. Um, I know there's a few issues there, and we have funding like to do the, the program, but then we're going to go back and um, look at areas where there are, are right. issues. If there are issues, can the funding be moved forward for that type of... Uh, uh, absolutely it can. Uh, what uh, the team is doing right now is they want to finish up uh, this phase and then there there are sort of key areas where they want to go back. Uh, if there's an, an immediate perception of safety issues, they would go in almost immediately. Okay. With regard to fire hall number eight, um, is the detailed design completely done? And is there anywhere on Ontario or on Canada where we could go and to where a, a, a fire station is perfect, the perfect design for firemen and and the public and, and whatever group you have, and so we don't have to pay ridiculous uh, sums of money for doing the design work. Can we not get one station somewhere in Canada that we can all use? 
So generally speaking with a fire station design, it's, it's somewhat templated uh, depending on the number of crews that are actually uh, going to be residing in the space. But um, we can certainly look at uh, other, what other juridic jurisdictions have done. We have just started um, doing preliminary design, so this is probably good timing. I would appreciate that because I realize now that it seems to me we spend an awful lot of money on, on our own design, hiring contractors. I mean, there's got to be some pool that we can all join in. It's like purchasing pools, so if we could do that. Anyhow, I appreciate uh, the presentation and uh, look forward to the next ones also. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Robinson, I think you had a question. Yes, I did, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. I have four. Is that okay? As many I as you'd like. I'm usually brief. Uh, Ms. Bell, very interesting presentation, very interesting budget. Uh, I may have missed it, but I think I heard you say that the budget, uh, the budget, the Harbor's Master Plan will be coming to Council before too long, or something to that effect, but I don't think you gave us a date. So, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, so the uh, Harbor's Master Plan will be contingent on the uh, completion of the negotiations with both OIS yeah. and the Bronte Outer Harbor. Yeah. So what will happen is you will see reports on both of those no negotiations coming before Council and once those reports have come to Council then the Harbor Master Plan can come. We're hopeful that it would be in the uh, Q2 of 2018. Thank you very much. Thank you for the conversation the other day on the telephone as well. It's been very helpful. Um, on this QEPCCC kitchen thing, mm -hmm. can you tell me what that will look like? Uh, not at the moment, because um, we're still um, in the process of starting to look at what the design will be. But we can certainly, um, I can keep you apprised of what the amenities will be in that kitchen once we've determined what the next well, steps will be. Well, well, who's going to use it? So that it would be a combination of the public and in, this, in the event that we had any type of evacuation, uh, that kitchen would be used to feed people at QEP. So it's not going to have anything to do with the little coffee shop that's there? No, now. it doesn't impact the coffee shop in any way. And how much is this kitchen going to cost? Do you have any idea? Um, so we will get back to you on that particular amount, but it should be noted that it's federal funding that's bringing that um, kitchen into play. All of it? Half of it. Half of it. Yeah. How much will our half be? Let me know. Okay. My third question is, uh, you've told us that for 2018, our, our uh, operating budget will be $176 million. Mm -hmm. How much was it, is it for this year? Um, I'm going to refer that to to the treasurer. What was what's our bu the overall commission budget for 2017? I might have it. Through you, Mr. Chair, we um, we don't total it by commission typically, so I will get back to you with the actual total for the commission. Well, I think it would for be very... For 2017 or for 2018? 17. For 17. 17. I want to compare it with what you're budgeting for this year, for next year. Oh, okay. Certainly. The slides, on the slide that uh, Commissioner Bell showed, it does show the change in each of the it programs does. within her commission. So we'll just have to add those up and get you the number. On slide nine in her okay, presentation. Okay, well, I'll wait till I hear back from you then. Okay. And one more for the thing, Ms. Bell. Certainly. Uh, this is an offline question, but I'm going to ask it here because it seems appropriate. I'd like to know the top five capital expenditures projected for Ward 1, and I don't expect to know this morning. Okay, we would be happy to provide that Thank to you, you Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Councillor Giddings? Thank you. A uh, couple of questions. Incredible growth in terms of... Uh, uh, activities at our community centers, mm -hmm. like year over year. Is this being felt through other 
municipalities near nearby to us? It depends on whether the municipality is in a growth situation or if their population has stabilized. But um, I also feel we need, do need to give credit to our programming teams because they have been um, very proactive in looking at programming that uh, residents are very interested in and they've been very um, aggressive in terms of when a program isn't making sense that that program gets cancelled. So combining the two together has led to, I think, really strong growth. Part of it being pickleball, I suppose. Uh, pickleball would definitely play in. Uh, in terms of the AODA comments, mm -hmm. uh, with cognitive disabilities being added, the net change, we're looking at about $457,000 for the coming year for transit planning and accessible services. Any sense of how much, like how do you forecast uh, increased ridership through, as a result of the AODA changes? It, it, it's an area that uh, we're actually really struggling with. Um, what we did do was we started to take a look at um, uh, areas where uh, we were hoping to uh, contain costs. So one of the things that we will be looking at uh, in terms of accessible transit is the possibility of a travel trainer um, as a cost containment measure. So what a lot of municipalities are doing, because they're finding that their accessible taxi and, and particularly the accessible taxi costs are, are really going through the roof, that many of uh, the riders that are choosing specialized transit with training and coaching could actually use conventional transit. So uh, you're seeing places like the TTC and some of the other uh, bigger transit authorities starting to look at those kinds of options. And those are the kinds of things that we're looking at in the, in the transit service plan, because you're absolutely right, it is very difficult to um, predict at this point in time. All right, and you were talking about the canker worm and gypsy moth BHK program. That's right. Um, I'd like to think that, well, Southeast is being particularly hit. Our canopy is of concern to all of Oakville. That's right. And we have a number of parts that have been included under the uh, pro uh, proposed plan. What about the individual street trees that were decimated as well? Because attack after attack, uh, we're going to end up losing these trees. Can we track that through service Oakville and do banding? on the individual trees where it doesn't make sense to do aerial spraying? Yeah. Yes, we can. And that would replace the need for localized or individual spraying, I take it? We, can, uh, we will certainly monitor what the calls uh, are in, with respect to this particular issue, and then the forestry team will look at what, what the best mitigation strategy so would be. So we can go back to last year's yep. and, and go from there? Yes. Um, great to see 30,000 trees and shrubs uh, planted. I'd be curious to see how much of that is a net increase, because that would include the EAB removals as well, I would take it? Yes, it would. Uh, I was remiss. I should have um, acknowledged the great work of our partner, Oakville Green. Um, we would not have been able to achieve those numbers without uh, their efforts, so I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge them. All right, because uh, I know we have some numbers in there in terms of uh, plantings. I'd be interested in the net increases. Yep, we can provide that. Thanks so much. Hey, any others? Uh, Councillor Liz Chirna. I'm not sure if uh, Commissioner Bell can answer this question, but uh, my question is regarding the uh, service Oakville. And looking at the key performance indicators uh, stating that uh, 75 or 74 percent were uh, within uh, 30 seconds, or oh, 75 percent actually, uh, response, is that during uh, business hours or is, uh, or is that uh, after business hours, that, that key performance indicator? I'm going to refer that to uh, Jane Cordemash. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, we measure for during hours of operation. Um, so what, for our after-hour service, I'd have to look at um, what reports come in from the after-hour service. Uh, the reason I ask is that uh, there's an ask for a new supervisor of performance, so that would be uh, to look at during business hours or overall performance? Overall, um, and it's also looking at what are the opportunities to, to look at other calls that come in through other channels that could be uh, managed through Service Oakville. 
Any other questions? I've got a couple. Uh, oh, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there uh, a need for uh, anything in the budget, uh, or have you provided in the budget to improve the call answer time for the uh, handicapped uh, transportation? I've been seeing uh, some uh, user comments to the effect that it takes a really long, I mean, an extraordinarily long time to answer those calls. Uh, the, the, when someone answers, the, the, the people that are writing to me praise the, the performance and attitude and, and everything. They just don't understand why it takes so long for the phone to be answered. Have you got a plan to deal with that? Uh, I, uh, I, I noted in some of the uh, email exchanges that there was a, there seemed to be a, a sense that uh, it had to, be, you know, that it was, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't, I don't find it acceptable, and uh, I was wondering, are you, are you on this? What are you doing about this? Uh, as a matter of fact, we are. So um, I had mentioned that we had introduced the online. Uh, the on-demand uh, scheduling software. And one of the reasons why we did that was because a number of our riders have said that they don't actually want to call in, they actually want to be able to do their own scheduling online. So with that, that will draw off a, a lot of calls where, you know, right now the only way you can schedule is by, the only way that you were able to schedule is through the telephone. So now this gives people an option, and my experience in, in introducing online services is that it will draw off a lot of calls, which means that the actual response times for the telephone channel will uh, go up dramatically. So it will provide um, two options for uh, riders to schedule, and it will improve response through both channels. This software, is it already in place? Yes, it is. How long has it been in place? A very short time. What is the target date to see the change? Uh, we would probably see a, a massive change probably within the first quarter of 2018. And what service standard for time to answer these calls that remain on the telephone side, what, what is the uh, target time to answer these calls? Just one moment. How about South Canada Revenue Software? So uh, Transit advises me that they have not set the performance standards yet, but they will be doing it in, in the next few weeks, and we will, <clears throat> excuse me, we will be able to provide that information to all members of council. Is the is the service standard at Service Oakville? Um, uh, it's well established. What's it? It's under under thirty seconds. Is is that going to be the standard for these other calls? That is our hope, because it's usually the, the, the ideal uh, standard for a telephone channel is two rings. That's less than 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. but that's like 12 seconds. Yes, but that is the ideal, that One is the, the ideal standard. the things you learn as mayor is that a ring is six seconds. Uh, all right, well, that's good news, and I'm glad to hear it. Thank you very much. Councillor Chisholm. Thank you. Colleen, with respect to the... Um, the rate stabilization re reserve of, uh, I think it's 521,000. Is this, is this a new procedure with respect because the part-time hourly rates and the, uh, the adjustments have to be made? This is not really in, in your budget, but rather it's an administrative transfer from a stabilization. And is this going to continue on? Or is this just a one-shot deal? It, it's a temporary uh, fix until such time as we've done our service reviews and we've looked at the operating model and uh, specifically the fitness model as well. So the intent is that we will find cost efficiencies and we will no longer be reliant on that. Would it be safe to say when we look at the part-time salaries and it's not just the what I call the bottom end of the grid, it's going to impact all the way through because of the, I guess, the gap or the adjustments through the part-time salary grid? Is that, would that be a safe assumption? Uh, are you referring to the impact of minimum wage? 
the impact the, the impact being starting at the government saying this is the new minimum but does it not reflect changes all the way through the grid so uh, it would def it definitely impacts both the the entry level but it also impacts uh, potential compression so we've had to look uh, all through our grids to make sure that we were adjusting accordingly so within within the stabilization reserve that's taken into account that whole adjustment through the, the grid so the stabilization reserve reference does not refer to the impact of a minimum wage it refers to the service level adjustment go ahead Nancy. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry, you, Mr. Mr. Chair. So in the recreation budget, we do have tax stabilization uh, funding in the recreation budget. So when you look at the net increase for recreation, that includes that, that funding. It's a temporary measure and it will come out, as, as Commissioner Bell said, as they go through a review. Um, the rates and fees, the minimum wage went to the $14. We have adjusted all of the bands. So so there's no compression so we're not just adjusting the bottom line and the others all stay static so that's why there is such a big impact um, and the the stabilization is helping to mitigate the impact of that and also the additional part-time FTEs that have been added into that budget okay, thank you and my last question with respect to you know my, my old world with the programs increasing you say we have a lot of wait lists and so forth and we hopefully we can accommodate down in the future but under the subsidization of children's programs every time we add a program it's a cost to the to the tax levy uh, yes it is okay so it would be a safe assumption you'll be coming back next year with a, with additional uh, budget with respect to new programs coming in online in specifically and I'm going to use the geographic area of North Oakville would that be a safe assumption to say that that will come back I think what we would be doing is we are, first of all, going to do the service review, uh, and which will be a lot more in-depth for recreation and culture, and then we'll determine the best way to proceed with respect to any new programming for youth. It'll be a very similar situation to what we did with the library. So uh, with the library, we looked uh, initially at cost savings, and then we looked at, at means by which, more creative means by which we could actually deliver services. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Okay, I've got a couple. Uh, I'll start with ones that I picked up um, during the conversation. First of all, can you tell us where the four pickleball court conversions are? Are they repainting of tennis courts? Is that... Uh... Do you have the... Shell Park, Glen Abbey, and existing So, Shell Park, Glen Abbey, and existing at Glen Ashen. And the, so, in counting the Glen Ashen ones that we've already got. Is mm -hmm. that right? Glen yeah. So, we already have... So, some of those are not new. They're already done. Um, the issue of the uh, canker worm spraying, um, some of that includes North Oakville as well. I understand that part of it, it goes does. up through Morrison Creek, for example. So I just want to make sure that we're it, all on the it, same It page. does. It's, it's okay. primarily in South, but the, the wealth is shared. The wealth of canker worms is shared, yes. <laughs> um, the Home to Hub, you named off a bunch of new areas that are going to be serviced through Home to Hub. Mm -hmm. um, can you provide that in a memo so that we've got a list of them? And how is that going to be rolled out and when? So because we've now got the on-demand uh, scheduling software, uh, that enables us to uh, do a broader expansion of Home to Hub. Um, so we will be able to uh, roll that out in Q1 of 2018. Great. So could we get a absolutely a short not looking for a big thing, just some brief, a briefing note on it? That'd be great. Uh, there's been some discussion about the Oakville Green uh, backyard planting program. I understand that they've got funding for a single year, and they're uh, looking for additional funding. Has there been any discussion with our staff with respect to the ongoing nature of that? program? Um, unfortunately, Chris Mark isn't here, so I will get back to you on that one. Okay, thank you. And uh, the last question <laughs> I've got for you is, uh, within the capital budget, you've got the, uh, the White Oaks Library renovation. It's a, one of your smaller capital projects. Uh, within that, is there some uh, review going to happen with respect to providing a stronger French collection at that library, given the new French high school across the street and the elementary school down the street as well? Yeah, uh, yes, there is. There is. Okay, yeah. so that's part of that project. That's great. And uh, finally, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, the staff who were working on all the capital plans. This year, you've done a, a much better job of defining where each of the projects are. So thank you very, very much for that. I noted it. Um, and I just wanted to compliment everybody for remembering to put all those details in. Um, 
I have one other question on the forecast. Uh, you've got a number of capital projects that have operating issues into the future, in future years. And as you know, we're working hard at trying to stabilize our uh, tax increases into 2019, 2020, and so forth. Um, has there been uh, thought given to shifting or moving some of those projects one way or the other in order to uh, mit mitigate the ups and downs of our increase over the years? Through you, Mr. Chair, I want to just take advantage of the opportunity of the, the, the issues you just alluded to. I do want to remind Council, uh, or this committee, that at the end of the 2017 budget process, Council's desire is to see over the next four years that our, our increases in the budget remain within the rate of inflation. Uh, recognizing that over the next couple of years we'll be bringing uh, an expanded Trafalgar Park back online, a southeast uh, community centre, as well as a, a fire station. Some of that will be covered by uh, growth with respect to increased taxing, because part of it is growth, growth related. But there are a lot of new expenses coming that will take us well. Without service level reviews and looking at our capital would take our budgets well beyond inflation. So when we talk about service reviews within the recreation, no department is going to escape service reviews over the next 12 to 18 months. In order to meet what you're looking for as a council and what this community is looking for, and given all the things that are going on, we will be taking a look at the organization as a whole, as well as each department and the services provided, looking at ways through processes like lean to look at how we do things, to look at cost reductions, and in some cases we may actually have to come back and talk about service level changes. So the, uh, the uh, instructions of, of staying within the rate of inflation uh, are, we take very seriously and we'll be looking at every service and program and how we do business and uh, to achieve those goals. And so while we have enjoyed programs increasing and the demand, we're going to have to look at how that continues to occur and can it continue to occur with respect to staying within those guidelines. Thank you very much. Anybody else have any questions before we move on? All right. Thank you very much Thank for you. your efforts this morning. We are now moving on to Community Development Commission. Uh, Councillor Adams and the Budget Committee, I'm pleased to present the uh, programs and services that are contained within the Community Development Commission. This slide here shows where you can find each of those programs and services within your budget book, uh, and they're listed out here with the appropriate tab numbers. Uh, most of or all of the directors and managers are here today. If you have any other detailed questions, uh, you'll find them all here uh, in order to assist me in answering. Accomplishments for 2017. Uh, we have spent considerable time on our official plan review. As you know, 2009, you had approved the official plan, the Livable Oakville plan. Uh, it was finally approved at the Ontario Municipal Board, I believe, in 2010. Um, so we have begun a, a review process, actually, the year before in 2016. Uh, this year of note is the urban structure report that uh, you had finalized in September with the approval of that amendment. Um, you are going to be looking at the three Main Street areas uh, in the coming meeting at Planning and Development Council. Uh, you also have had a consultation on the Spears Corridor study and, of course, the Employment Commercial Review. Uh, you will be looking at amendments for that in the uh, first, first meeting, actually, in January or shortly after that. Also, in terms of the Livable Oakville strategic goal, we've looked at the master plans for the former hospital site. Uh, this was a study that had started with the South Central Public Land Study back in, I think, 2013. And so now it is coming to a conclusion with a, uh, an overall plan of how we're going to look at that site as a comprehensive site. Uh, in addition, the Brantwood Master Plan, 
Both of those reports you'll see again on the um, uh, 4th of December at Planning and Development Committee or Council, which will finish those. Under the environmental leadership category, we have the stormwater master plan underway. This is quite an extensive plan. It is the first type of, of stormwater plan that the town has undertaken at this level. Um, it certainly looks at the impacts of climate change. It's not just looking at the past trends, it's understanding what are some of our future challenges with climate change and doing, through that modeling, some sensitivity analysis so that we are not just re re responding to the past, but we can look forward into the future. Phase two will actually be completed in 2U in about um, the first quarter of uh, 2018. Um, and then that will enable us to begin the um, financing portion of that, which will be a significant endeavor to look at how we retain and improve in our stormwater master plan. We finished two environmental studies on our creek and, um, uh, creek and erosion studies on the Taplow Creek and the uh, Morrison Creek, um, both in uh, 2018 or 2017, I'm mean, here you're ahead of myself. <laughs> the health protection bylaw, we, you just received a port report recently. Uh, we have all the major emitters now in compliance with that bylaw, um, which is uh, uh, a major step forward in terms of uh, the implementation of that uh, program. And of course, you have the updated the environmental strategic plan this year as well. On the cultural side, we have actually spent a fair amount of time on the cultural um, side of things. Uh, the cultural heritage landscape is an uh, uh, improvement that's been made to provincial policies, which certainly allows us then to look at that in a much more extensive way. You had started that in 2009 when you had adopted the Little Bulkville Plan, uh, and then in 2014 you had adopted a strategy. And so during 2017 we were actually able to take the phase one of the work that was completed in 16, Oh, the phase two was then completed in 17, which looked at those eight priority sites that we needed to investigate further in terms of implementing the culture heritage landscape. You've also seen the first one roll forward, uh, which is the Glen Abbey site, looking at uh, implementation of that plan, and you'll see more of that in the coming uh, months. The first and second conservation district plan was also approved at the board. Uh, both legal and planning staff were involved in that, and so now we have those plans currently in place. And of course, Lakeshore, Lakeshore Road, uh, very early in this year, you approved the lighting and the street furniture, very much in that traditional style. Um, so that was in place in 2017 to then support the design work that will be completed this or in 2018. Under good governance, we've been responding to the changing uh, or the new sharing economy. Um, Jim Barry and his group brought forward two bylaws, the short-term rental, which enabled us to respond to the Airbnb um, sharing economy, and then of course the transportation network company licensing, which uh, with Lyft coming into the GTA area, this will put us in good stead in order to respond to those. The pedestrian safety program we also brought forward fairly recently, and you have a report on your agenda on how to fund that. And so that's looking at the pedestrians and how we um, actually provide for them uh, safe crossings across our streets. On the outstanding service to residents, uh, there was a report in early spring that we brought forward on several measures to improve the, um, the activities in infill development. It's been having quite an impact on our residents. Uh, and so it looked at such things as giving better notice to them when changes were happening within their community, creating a builder's liaison committee so that we had better information exchange between the actual builders undertaking the work. Uh, we also brought in the lot maintenance bylaw, which drastically shortened the time frame in which we could require enforcement. Um, so though all those programs are moving forward. Another piece of that is we have lots of inspectors throughout the town out there. Uh, ensuring that all the inspectors are aware of the various bylaws so we can more infect, effectively enforce. We also are undertaking the building services review. You had funded that last year. It's well underway now. We expect um, that we'll have some preliminary recommendations for us to move forward with early in 2018. Uh, this is very much a program that's focused on how can we deliver better customer service that's supported and backed up by an effective and efficient process in the building department. Um, and so that's very much a focus uh, of this coming year. So the Lakeshore Road Bridge, you celebrated the opening of that just last week. Um, that was completed in 2017. 
And I think downtown you've seen the Honk program or pay by phone, um, both in the downtown and the Curry area have been implemented in this year. Moving on to the, K, the uh, uh, key performance outcomes, these first set of outcomes that you see on the screen are all community measures. So they're focused around our air quality, uh, which are the first two. The second is the time in which we've been able to uh, look at um, uh, bylaw and licensing enforcement, which you can see has consistently been shrinking over from 2013. Uh, the next is the uh, pavement program um, that you fund through the uh, roads resurfacing program. And then the last one is a, an ISO standard that we've been moving to, and it shows the uh, amount of bike paths uh, per 100,000 population. These are fairly good measures. They're all moving in a positive direction. Um, so they're, they're important ones to note, and most of them in the book that relate to community measures are improving. There's another set of co uh, key program outcomes that I've highlighted here, and they're around the service delivery. And we have been some having challenges with the service delivery. Um, the first one is related to building permits and the time frame that they've um, been processing in. These are applications that come in as complete. Um, so that time period has increased. Uh, we have been struggling with the volume, and that's consistent through all these service levels of applications and complexity of applications that are, that are coming in. But in particular, in the building department, we've had two building codes that we've had to implement on all of the uh, um, applications because of the appeals on our recent in-zone work. Uh, you also have a changing um, Ontario building code, which has uh, been challenging in order to implement. And we have staffing issues. So you had resolved the staffing issues in a report in the spring. I think there are four uh, ungapped or gapped positions now are, ga are filled. Um, and so that has certainly helped with uh, looking at our re us reduce that time. The in-zone bylaw, too, is being finalized, so we ha now have one bylaw. Uh, the OBC is still a changing uh, piece, and of course the Building Services Review, we hope will address some of the efficiency in the processes that we have. We're very much looking at the lean approach. It fits very well in assessing those programs uh, through that review. On the planning side, um, there has been a, also a similar uh, reduction in the time frame uh, for us to deal with applications. Applications are generally getting much more complex uh, than they have in the past. The time frames for us to get comments from other agencies, um, given the environmental review that's necessary and required, uh, the regional review that happens at the same time, has become a, a, a difficulty or a challenge on most of the applications. Um, and so you can see that impacting our time frame. I would also suggest that the province has been very active of late in reviewing many of their policy and requirements, so we spend a fair amount of time reviewing those policies as we move forward, which has impacted the timing for us to, to deal with the applications. In terms of development engineering, what you see is the last line on the screen. They've um, turned around their permit applications, which are mostly the uh, site alteration and the road corridor type of permits, uh, pretty consistently over the years. So moving into 2018, we'll be continuing with our official plan review. So you'll see the North Oakville piece come forward in uh, 2018. Uh, the rental, the uh, uh, residential character study, uh, which is a very detailed study looking at individual neighborhoods, will be working through 2018, probably bringing to you in 2019 some of the conclusions on that, um, that piece of work. We'll also be looking at the three major growth areas, so Palermo, Midtown, and Uptown, and so we'll be getting work on that early in 2018. On the uh, uh, master plan front, we have the transportation master plan that we'll be bringing for you, forward to you in January. We spent an awful lot of time in 2017 revising that and looking at very different types of models on how to distribute the modal split. Uh, the stormwater master plan will be completed in 2018. We are initiated the community energy plan, which you'll see a report on it fairly soon. Uh, that is going to be very much benefited by a partnership with uh, Sheridan in terms of uh, being able to implement that with fairly significant funding from other provincial and federal groups. The biodiversity strategy you also see in 2017, and the biodiversity strategy sets an overall framework that allows us to look at urban forest plan, our planting program, 
uh, uh, the way in which we treat various infrastructure projects that come forward in terms of understanding their, their impact on the, the biodiversity. Um, so it sets an overall framework for those things, and you'll see that in 2018. And of course, we'll be moving forward with the Kerr and the Burl Oak. You heard quite a bit of those last, uh, the other night, Monday night, uh, with Metro Links. We'll be moving forward with those, mostly focused in 2018 on the Kerr with the ac acquisition of the properties needed to implement that uh, grade separation. In terms of the downtown, we will be finalizing the design. Uh, so the very detailed design of what the street actually looks like will happen in 2018. And we'll be bringing forward also a mitigation plan at the same time. Uh, the marijuana legislation will be quite significant in 2018. Of course, the federal government wants it implemented by July. Uh, the town's been very supportive of the approach the province is using with the LCBO model. That's a, a good way of moving forward. Uh, we are still a little concerned on the enforcement side in terms of who had, takes on those responsibilities and we've been working with the province trying to understand their direction and where they want to go. Uh, but it is a, uh, a significant concern and impact on our resources going forward. Of course, the building services review, which I've already spoken to. Uh, major development applications, we have uh, quite a few development applications, two significant ones, which I would mention. And that's the Glen Abbey application. Uh, it has uh, uh, taken up considerable resources, evaluating that fairly extensive application. It has a significant impact on the town and our urban structure. And so that has um, certainly consumed a lot of time in 2017, and it will continue to do that in 2018. The other application I'd mention is the life science. This is a very exciting application for an employment area. But at the same time, it challenges the way we not only look at our policy requirements, but it challenges how we actually in, undertake technical work. So um, working through that application has been quite complex. Uh, the last two I'd note for 2018 is uh, with all of the changes to the sharing economy, bringing in the bylaws on the, the, the short-term rental, as well as the um, uh, transportation network licensing, uh, we do need to look at the way in which we uh, develop our fees and our cost recovery and municipal enforcement, just to make sure that they are in line and we're taking advantage of all opportunities in order to fund that program. And lastly, we are going to look at the downtown parking garage in terms of how we operate that facility going forward. It needs a good review. It's been there for quite some time, um, and it will uh, benefit from that refresh. So those are the highlights for 2018 that I wanted to share with you. So in terms of our program um, cost drivers, um, of course we have the construction uh, drivers that are there in terms of increasing costs, uh, resourcing of our construction programs. But the most significant one for uh, the programs and services in this commission is related to our revenue. And so as Nancy had said in her opening uh, presentation on Monday, um, the, uh, we've moved to a new way of uh, uh, projecting revenue in these three departments. So what I've shown on the screen here is the actual, um, the budgeted is in green, I believe. It's hard, very hard to see on the screen. Um, and the actuals are in red. So that over the last 10 years, since 20, 2007, is uh, the uh, revenues that we've gotten in. And really what I'm trying to show from this chart is it is very difficult to project revenue. There are so many things that influence it, the economy, uh, the timing of an individual development going forward. Um, one application could consider considerably impact the revenue get in when you look at the size of the, um, the size of the fee that comes in with an application. And on the planning side, it's even more difficult to do that because it's at the very beginning of the process. Uh, the decision to move forward is by an individual developer is dependent on a variety of things. Um, and so one may decide not to move forward and we've expected them to, uh, which drastically impacts the revenue. And you can see that on the chart. Um, I think the timing of the allocation programs, which we assume will happen at a certain time and then they may slow down, also has impacted the way that we uh, can um, project our revenue. So you see on the planning, we've been even farther off. Development engineering, we begin to get a little bit closer in terms of the actual and the budget, mostly because a lot of those fees, to, to some extent, are driven by regular road corridor, 
um, temporary use types of things. And those things are pretty consistent over time, so you're able to project those fairly well. The building side has a little bit more flexibility, but by the time you get to issuing a building permit, um, a developer usually has already spent a fair amount of money. They're going to continue to proceed. We also have the benefit of seeing it come through the development process. So this year, what we've moved to is to take an average, about a seven-year average, um, and use that as our means to estimate in the revenue coming from those departments. Uh, what that does, the previous impact is that if there was a big difference between our actuals and our budget amounts, so for example, we budgeted thinking it was low, um, and if you look on the planning side, the differences between those green and red lines. So we assumed in the budget we would get a certain amount, and then we got a whole bunch. We actually overpaid on the tax side. Conversely, if we were under, uh, in terms of revenue, well, there was a variance for them, which you saw last year in development engineering, for example. So by flatlining this and going with an average, it allows us to collect at an average level, which, you know, the peaks and valleys, we can pretty well judge fairly well. Um, and then where we're under, we can rely on tax stabilization. And when we're over, we pay back into tax stabilization. So it has a much more limited impact on the taxes. So that's new for this year. And that uh, will, we certainly evaluate this every year. Um, to see uh, whether or not we are capturing those peaks and valleys in terms of that average number. So in terms of the uh, community development tax levy, you can see through this slide the changes uh, that have happened over 2017 to 2018. I would note that on the, the planning side and the development engineering side, you're seeing the impact, the one-time impact of moving to that average uh, so their, um, their increases look more significant. So in terms of the uh, gross and operating budget, the, the Community Development Commission is about 11% of the overall gross budget. And because of the revenue uh, in the most of, a lot of the departments, we reduced to about five, just under 5% at the net. You can see here in terms of the operating budget where those uh, funds are spent, uh, predominantly on staffing. The internal expenses and transfers uh, relate to the um, others uh, perform uh, components for the um, development application process. So there's a, a internal transfers back and forth. On the gross operating budget, for each of the program areas, you see them split out here, both on the gross and the net side. So on the gross operating budget, you see building as being the most significant, uh, with um, uh, planning being second. But as you move over into the net operating budget, the building department drops quite some considerably. They have a 100% cost recovery. Um, infrastructure planning becomes much more significant as a lot of those programs rely on the tax base as well as municipal enforcement. Uh, the planning uh, section is about a 50% cost recovery, so there's 50% of their costs uh, related to our OP review or heritage program. Those types of things are funded through the tax base. So looking to the future, I have six buckets. Um, in terms of the future. Uh, the impact of new legislation will continue uh, to deal with this. We have uh, Bill 139, which I understand is going through third reading today. So hopefully we'll have a new OMB uh, uh, process to work with, which will be much more of a benefit to us. Um, so that's one example. There's also the Ontario Building Code that's coming out. Uh, 2019 is when most of those changes take effect. Uh, you have the marijuana legislation that's uh, coming as well. So there's a whole variety of provincial legislation that certainly impacts the way we move forward. Infill development um, is certainly going to be an area where we will have to pay attention to. We've done a fair amount of work with the community, for example, on the Committee of Adjustment, on how better to represent the character of the community through that process. That will continue. We also need to look at the building side, too, to make sure that as building and changes occur in the neighborhood, they're done in a way that certainly respects the neighbors. 
Uh, the uh, climate change and resiliency, there's two components to this that I wanted to flag. One is climate change you've seen with the lake impacts. Um, the other, uh, the flooding in Burlington uh, two years ago now. Those will impact on our infrastructure and how we need to design our infrastructure going forward. So it is a, a cost element that we need to understand. We no longer can look to the past as we are doing in our stormwater plan. We need to look to the future and create some models and sensitivities so that we can make sure that we're understanding the full impact of that. On the resiliency side, all of our infrastructure needs to move to that resiliency. But there are also other changes that are happening. There's technology changes, there's the autonomous vehicle, which will impact us in terms of our transportation and the way in which we deliver it. Uh, there are the sharing economy, as you've seen in uh, municipal enforcement in those bylaws. There's quite a few changes out there that we're going to have to respond to coming into the future. Uh, the service delivery challenges, as Colleen had said, uh, certainly in their commission, they're experiencing that. As you've seen from our uh, key performance indicators, we are experiencing that as well. Uh, we are, through the building services review, moving to more, much more of a customer focus. Um, we also have initiated a property-centric uh, review, which what that does is, uh, if you're issuing a building permit, for example, it's always preceded by something else. There's a site alteration permit, there could be a heritage permit, uh, and after you get your building permit, there's lots of other requirements that come in in terms of your road corridor and what you need to do. So in fact, to um, move forward on a more simplified process, we need to look at all those services. And under the property centric, we are looking at the full range of services that a property owner would come in in order to make a change on their property. And the focus of that is to get a good customer process, an effective and efficient process, and good data analytics so we can move to a more continuous improvement. Uh, litigation, uh, we have a number of uh, uh, hearings and litigation uh, on the land use side that we're working through. That will probably not disappear in 2018. Uh, while the OMB legislation will certainly benefit us substantially, it is still something that we'll be dealing with as we fall with between the two pieces of legislation. And the current construction challenges was the last one. And this is in an area if there's a lot of activity going on throughout the GTA, a lot of funding at the provincial um, and the federal level. So there is competition for those um, uh, construction material, which will impact our costs. Uh, there is a resourcing from the town's ability as the approvals of those types of construction programs get much more complex in terms of the properties that you're impacting or the approvals that you need from other agencies. So those are six that I've highlighted in terms of our challenges and moving forward into the future. You have two reports on your agenda. One is the Flashing 40 report, which is requesting 156,000 one-time funding. Um, that will uh, allow us, and you see in that report, specific sites that are listed in order to be able to put up the Flashing 40. Uh, this expands the program that we currently have. And so that, uh, that is a report that you have to deal with as an additional request. Uh, the second one is the Pedestrian Safety Program. So as I had mentioned earlier, this is a program that looks at providing for um, increased safety for the pedestrians crossing the road. We had the traffic crumbing program previously, which didn't put as much of a focus on the pedestrian. And so this does, and it's requesting a $200,000 increase to the budget, which would be an ongoing. And each year, very similar to the traffic calming program, we'd be looking at various areas in order to um, put in uh, pedestrian crossings of the roadway. And so we would stage that over a number of years. That is both uh, the actual construction of the um, uh, crossing itself, but also uh, an educational program that we're looking at in that. Moving on to the capital budget, I've listed about eight of the major capital uh, programs here. They're all construction programs, uh, with road resurfacing certainly being the most prominent on the list. Um, but we're looking at spears. Uh, both, uh, there's two Spears Road projects that are on there. Of course, the Kerr Street um, uh, grade separation is there as well, and that's mostly to acquire the land that are, are necessary in, in 2018 in order to move forward with that project. 
Uh, there are also two uh, water uh, re, uh, uh, projects with the Shelburne Promenade at Sheldon Creek and then the Morrison Creek. So there's a highlight of the uh, eight uh, capital projects. So in terms of the overall capital uh, projects, infrastructure planning is the biggest uh, within this commission. It takes up about 28% of the overall uh, budget, capital budget. You can see here the split between the various areas with infrastructural renewal being about 44% of the, the budget and still the predominant 54% 50, being the growth element. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Very good, Mayor Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation and the information. Um, when you mentioned climate change, you reminded me of the uh, project that we launched, uh, it seems to me, a year or two ago to work on uh, stormwater management, uh, uh, a stormwater management report, I'll call it. Uh, where is that? Uh, is that buried in here somewhere or is it, is it in, uh, is it done? Is it doing? What's going on? So the master plan had, the stormwater master plan had gone out for consultation in, the, in June. I think it was June. It was the spring. We expect to be bringing that back to you in April of uh, next year. So that'll be the completion of the, the work and it will identify the types of projects that we need to put in place in order to ensure the integrity of our stormwater system. I look forward to that one. Councillor Alger. Jane, thanks for the presentation. Um, you mentioned the council report refer and referrals and you mentioned the flashing 40 kilometer uh, zone lights and uh, I guess we're just receiving information today, but like we're looking at 108,000 for the nine locations, and we have you have another uh, uh, four locations. You're saying for another 48,000, which could could maybe fall into the mix if we mm -hmm. if you had the money. And at the uh, I'm not sure this is probably isn't the appropriate time, but if staff could prepare going forward to add in uh, Emily uh, Carr School, and uh, like I figure for not, for for a total of 60,000 additional. If it's a safety issue for children crossing and safety, um, I, I think probably we should approve the additional also and throw in the other Emily Carr school with that because safety is a big concern. I, driving doesn't seem to be getting better in Oakville, respecting speed limits, I've noticed. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a concern around the town and there's a, the idea is to get children to walk to school more than be driven to school, which could make a big difference also. So um, I think that one is uh, very important going forward. So I, I'd like to add that one. Um, the other thing I'd like to talk about is, uh, and I, I, need, I need some information from you, our service levels for planning services. A and you mentioned the, re the, the detail that's required, is, there is so much. Who sets the standard? Like our standard may be, is it a province that tells us what we have to deal with? Because there should be some kind of a, of a level where it's a, if this application only has this, you know, so a, a minimum detail, then it's so many days. But the, some of them are just so complex where you need information from various uh, different levels, like the region, the conservation authority, uh, whoever else may be uh, on the list. Yeah. Uh, so if I can just skip back to the Emily Carr for one minute. Right. On the Emily Carr, we'll bring back some information, I think, and we'll probably identify it on the list of, as this one will be, the okay. pedestrian, in terms of what would be the additional cost of that and a little background on that actual crossing. Okay. Uh, so Thank we'll you. do that as we move forward in the budget process. Thank you. In terms of your question and um, on the timing, yes, some applications are very, very complex. Um, it takes a, a probably a, a year or two to complete some of the environmental assessment work that needs to be undertaken in North Oakville. And it takes considerable time for Conservation Halton, our own staff, and the region to evaluate those as an example. And so what we are looking at, with Bill 139, what it does is it, it substantially changes um, the... Um, the requirements of, of a developer going forward at the board and actually puts the onus quite a bit on them to evaluate um, how they fit within uh, provincial policy. Previously, I think under the, the current process, the requirement is for us to defend why it meets our policies. The onus is flipped around and it's almost as if you have to defend why it doesn't meet the policies. And then it sets specific times. 
Um, if you miss those time periods under the new legislation, you go to a full hearing at the entire municipal board, which is, I'm sure, not what we would want to happen. Um, because I think we want to decide on those applications ourselves. So we are looking at right now, how can we um, beef up the requirements for complete applications? So for example, perhaps we require a public information meeting to be held before it's even complete. Perhaps we require those conservation homes to be in before we say it's complete. Um, so that we upfront a lot of that work before we then spend our time at it. So those very complicated application, the work is done outside of those time periods that are now going to be in the act. So that's some of the things that we're looking at in order to respond to uh, the new legislation. And I, th I think uh, staff beat themselves up pretty badly to meet the time frames. And it, it looks bad if we you know, don't get things done. But Something is fundamentally wrong with the whole process now, and I like the, what you're saying, if, if in fact we have the ability to do that. Do that, we have the ability with Bill 139 to say so, it's not complete until Conservation Halton, as an example, has completed all of their work? That's what we're exploring. There is the requirement in the Planning Act now where um, you can establish through your official plan what are the complete application requirements. So that's what we'll be looking at doing as we move forward into early part of 2018. So 2018, we will be doing that for sure? Uh, we, yes. And we've got the staff to do that? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, no, that's <laughs> good. I'm just, I'm just asking. <laughs> we will be looking for some advice um, from others, but um, yes, I, it's, an, it's an important thing to move forward. I think it's critical part of moving forward. I, th I thank you very much for that. Councillor Giddings. Thank you. Uh, utilization rate of parking spaces by commercial district. I'd like some further information on that. They've combined uh, the three commercial districts together. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see a breakout of that. In terms of traffic signal optimization program, I mm -hmm. thought Alan would have beat me to that one. Uh, I'd like some further information, timelines, um, con concern for all of us. And in terms of the item you were just talking about with the uh, 40 kilometer an hour zones, mm -hmm. great to see the locations on there. Uh, similar to Councillor Elder, I'd like to see new central looked at on that or further information uh, they do have frontage on lakeshore through lake uh, through lakeshore road entrance mm -hmm. similar uh, to clanmore uh, they have an exit onto it and uh, we don't have a uh, we have a crossing guard there but uh, i'd like that looked at and i'd also be curious in further details on chisholm academy it's a uh, four lane 60 click and like some further details on that one the you mentioned the uh, efforts in planning and got to give you another plug for the committee of adjustment book that we worked with the residents and the community about it's been a huge it's not a bestseller as yet but it <laughs> certainly comes in handy for people when they see the committee of adjustment sign come up so kudos on that one the permits uh, number of us have met with you on an ongoing basis I increase I appreciate the frustration it's full cost recovery on it so I look forward to plans on how we can move that forward mm -hmm. quickly well Thanks. the building services review will help us with that I would note actually if I could on the um, uh, I'll bring what we can on the, the utilization of the parking spaces in the commercial areas um, uh, but it does depend on the studies that we had done. And you'll note in the KPIs, I don't think we have for 2016 and 17 utilization rates in there. Um, so I, I just caution you on the extent of information we'll be able to bring back on that. Councillor Lucerna. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm actually uh, not sure, again, if it's in this section because I have a question under tab 24, which is economic development. I don't see it under programs and services in this section, but is this the right place to ask? Sure. Okay. 
So again, I'm looking at, well, because it's not in corporate services either, so I, I wasn't sure where to go. Under KPIs, again, uh, the number of businesses uh, from 2016 to 2017 uh, has gone down. And uh, I, my question is, do we have appropriate resources in the economic development area to address this? Or, um, or if you can make a comment on somebody, I'm not sure who, um, regarding this number. No. Thank you. No. We will get back to you on that. Yeah. Any others? Okay, I have a couple of questions uh, for you. Uh, could we speak about the grade separations for a minute? We've got two grade separations going on. Uh, what element of federal funding is expected in those grade separations? On the federal funding? <laughs> I didn't think there was any. I'm looking at Dan over there. There is no federal funding. It was a provincial program that was being looked at with mostly Metro Links. And I do believe, uh, Mr. Chair, the federal funding flows through to the province, which is then flowing through to Metro Links. There is no direct federal funding with the town of Oakville. However, it would be funding in partnership with Metro Links. So the federal announcements that happened just before the last election, smokescreen? Okay, good, good to know. Just make sure we're clear on that then, eh? Um, can, since we, we were asking about economic development a minute ago, uh, two questions for you, the downtown. Mayor Burton, did you want to go back to our great separation? Yeah. Okay, then that's, well, I'll wait for the others. To be fair, um, uh, after the election, in fact, only earlier this year, the Prime Minister did come and make an announcement in Toronto about federal funds going to grade separations, and I believe it was acknowledged that the money constitutionally was going to go through the province to come to the grade sep. And he did mention uh, both of ours, and that did occasion some intensive conversations between my office and Metrolinx, between me and Metrolinx, on uh, what their priorities were, because um, uh, their position was that they decide which grade steps, not the Prime Minister. And so when Metrolinx came the other night and said that uh, both of ours are um, in their plan, one for and, and their charming way of putting it, one was not before 2019 and the other was not before 2020. At least we had dates and, and, and they were accepted as priorities. So there's a little bit of good news uh, to balance off the, the uh, cynicism about election announcements. <laughs> well, I, I, the, I guess the question is, uh, and maybe our staff don't know, maybe you know from the discussions that you've had, has there been any um, comment about how much federal money is supposed to flow through Metrolinx to us? The, the plan for grade steps, the tradition, and uh, the, the CIO can uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is 50-50 uh, between the municipality and Metrolinx. And, uh, that, and I imagine that all of Metrolinx's money, for all we know, could be from the feds. It's their affair. Um, I, um, I think the best way to know will be if we ever have a photo op at a grade sep again, because you know there's been a bunch of photo ops at future, announcing future grade separations. Uh, if any feds show up, we can ask them how much they think they kicked in. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, I think the difficulty, and it started with the, the Burl Oak grade separation. At that time, the announcement was that between the province and the federal government, there would be no cost to the city of Burlington and the town of Oakville. We actually adjusted our budget based on those, and then going forward uh, after the election, and Mayor Burton's quite correct, everything has flowed through the feds to Metro Links. We are benefiting by it. But in the case of Burl Oak, both Oakville and Burlington will be uh, sharing 50% of the cost. And in the case of um, Kerr Street, I believe 
It's in that same order of magnitude. In that same order of magnitude with a little wave of the hand. All right. I'll satisfy myself with that for now. Thank you. Uh, Be cautious in campaigns, I guess. I guess so, huh? So, um, are, we, are we done with the grade separation? Okay. <laughs> Wasn't it was fun. It was fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, can I ask you a couple of questions about economic development? Um, first of all, we've got the, the post office site downtown that we're working on doing renovation so that we can move people into it. Can you give us an update on that and where that stands and what the plan is most recently? I'm going to defer that to Ray, actually. Okay. Oh. oh, perfect. And we can and we can come back to the KPI question perhaps now, too. So with regards to the post office, um, uh, a contract has been awarded to uh, undertake the work for the construction of the marketing and information office related to the downtown streetscape project. Uh, following that, the construction office and a boardroom will be constructed uh, early in the new year. So the marketing and information office will be complete by the end of 2017. We are also um, just about to submit a Fed Dev application for some funding that would be related to the creation of innovation space on the first floor of the post office. And, and when does that happen and how does that happen? Uh, through um, the FedDev application. Yeah. Uh, we anticipate having that submitted um, prior to the Christmas break, and it's a two-phase application. Um, we would hope to get uh, early, um, early confirmation from FedDev to move on to the second phase of the application in January, and the funds that we're looking at matching dollars to the town's uh, already committed investment in the post office um, would be um, Fed Dev funding that's for the 2018 fiscal year. And what impact does that have on the the budget for the the location, if it, any? It would provide us um, the ability to put in air conditioning in the post office on that first floor, uh, to provide some f um, furniture, and to make it really truly an um, a space that people want to come to and enjoy and work in as an innovation district. Okay, so it gives us an upgrade. That's so, correct. Okay, great. Uh, there was, was <coughs> excuse me, there was a question earlier about do we have adequate resources in the ECDEV department generally, I think was sort of the, the direction. Is that correct, Councilor Lestrina? Uh, well, the first part of it was respect to the number of businesses per 100,000 population as a KPI, and it's gone down uh, this year. And I if there's a comment on that, and then regarding the resourcing. Uh, through you, Councillor Adams. Uh, I would say with respect to the, um, the KPIs for the number of businesses, it's difficult to make those year-over-year -year comparisons right now. The data that's being used for those KPIs is based on the region's employment survey data. Um, we've got data in there from 2015, and because of the difficulty in undertaking those surveys. There's so much information, it depends who they're speaking with, uh, looking at subsidiaries and so forth. Um, the exact comparisons from year to year right now, I would say are not, um, uh, not entirely reliable. We look at the overall numbers from year to year uh, and there isn't a, really a significant change in them to, to warrant our attention. And last question for you, uh, within the budget document, there's a comment about a focus on China. We just had a uh, China forum two Fridays ago, I guess now, I think it was. Um, what's contemplated in the budget for 2018 on that piece? Uh, we have an, uh, just a, f a few initiatives for 2018 that are already uh, in the planning. We will be holding a, a seminar for our retail businesses and with a real focus on the three BIAs. Uh, we hope to partner with the Chamber on this event to help them understand e-commerce platforms and opportunities in doing business with China. It's a huge market for them to tap into. Um, we will also be um, uh, looking at planning a trade mission and we 
uh, through our last forum that we held last Friday on doing business with China. We did a survey. Uh, we'll be following up with that information to understand our local businesses and those uh, who may have interest in participating in a trade mission um, next year. And is there a budget impact on a trade mission? Uh, there, there, will, th there may be a budget impact and that is what we still have to determine. So is there contemplation within this budget for something or not? Uh, is it is it above and beyond? Do we, are we is it is there any cost that would be borne by the town of Oakville, or is um, are we looking to create a program that would fund internally uh, whatever cost we might have? If we undertake a bit, uh, a trade mission in 2018, there would be an additional budget implication for uh, staff participating in it. So that would be a separate report that would come. That's correct. To council. Okay, so it's outside of the scope of what we're talking about today. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, that's all I had for you. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much. We appreciate all the information, and I think we're ready for the Corporate Services Commission. Okay, I think we are all back in the room and ready to go again. We're just trying to make sure that there's nothing missing at the front here. Yes, I'm looking at you. <laughs> you're, you're ready? Okay. <laughs> Commissioner, thank you. We're looking forward to your information. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to present Corporate Services Commission and uh, the highlights of our, of our budget presentation on uh, On slide two, you can see the programs that are covered in our commission, human resources, financial services, regulatory services, information systems, legal services, and financial and construction management. Um, <clears throat> maybe at the outset, I would like to say that many of the, uh, many of the uh, programs that you've seen pre presented uh, this morning from the other commissions, uh, we participate very, very deeply in those in those things. So while we don't have public facing activities to stand on their own, uh, we are deeply involved in many of the programs and that will come through as I'm, as I'm making my remarks. Um, I think a key uh, program uh, indicator for corporate services is uh, um, how it relates to the rest of the corporation. So uh, sometime this week there was a presentation from, uh, from uh, uh, the United Way, and we were talking about what percentage of the funding actually goes out and is given to the uh, to the recipients, and what does it cost to run the administration? And I sort of feel the same way about corporate services. Um, if corporate services is climbing against the rest of the organization, then in my view there is something wrong. And um, you can see that uh, we are pretty steady. And going back to 2013, and I can tell you going back much farther than that, uh, corporate services percent of gross budget has remained quite stable. And uh, the percentage of FTEs also has remained quite stable. Uh, there has been a recent uh, slight downturn, as you can see from the, see from the graph. Um, our key performance, our key program outcomes, I've just picked it a selection of what I think are highlights. Um, I, um, this chart goes back to 2012. Um, I probably should have just taken out 2012 and taken it back to 2013 so you see a five-year average. But you can see meetings in open session. We are about 96% of our meetings are in open session. Uh, there's a lot of consideration going on behind the scenes uh, to determine whether a, a program should be in open session. Our bias is towards open session and I think the numbers reflect that. Um, here. Um, increased learning from leads. We have a very vibrant um, staff development program. We call it LEADS. Um, I think in terms of uh, municipalities, we probably measure up very, very well. And about 97% of the people who uh, take a LEADS program think that they have benefited from the program. Um, they uh, reflect that they've had increased learnings because of, uh, because of that, that program. Um, the full life of assets achieved, this is an interesting one. Uh, we were clicking along in the 70s and then last year, 
2017, it bumped up into the 90s. This is a reflection of better data. We've heard a recurring theme coming out from both of the other commissioners that um, uh, we are uh, becoming more and more dependent on data and we are able to um, uh, get at better information. And this is a reflection of that. Our uh, asset management program has been developing very, very strongly over the last couple of years. And this 90% is actually a mathematical calculation. So I would say that the, uh, the 70 percent were based on uh, incomplete data and the 90% is much, much more complete data and I think reflects very well. Your objective, our objective, is to try and maximize the life of assets wherever, wherever possible. Um, and we will see changes in that in the coming years as our asset management program moves from a timetable to define the full life to a condition assessment which would define the full life. Uh, our audit is clean. Um, I was able to update 2016 because we received the audit for 2016 in April of this year. We will not receive the audit for 2017 until April of 2018. So that will get filled in um, retrospectively. And our, our stabilization reserves have declined slightly. Um, this, uh, <clears throat> however, we are still above the GFOA recommendation of 17 percent. Uh, 17% reserves. If I move to uh, 2017 accomplishments, um, under accountability, uh, we are almost finished stage two of the asset management plan. So we undertook the asset management plan over two years. To me, this is a fundamental plan. Um, it will allow us to, as I said, measure the, the, uh, the quality of our assets based on uh, condition ass assessment as opposed to on expected life of the asset. Uh, the first year we did three categories. This year we're doing building fleet and equipment and communications technology. The work is wrapping up now. We will not officially finish it till January, but there's very little more to be done. So I have, uh, I've, I've called that a... Uh, uh, 2017 accomplishment. Um, it's interesting. Litigation has been uh, has been a topic of conversation here for uh, the other two commissions. I'm happy to say our legal department lived through 2017. They've been had a very busy and challenging year. Um, um, uh, they are they are um, responding to those challenges very well. Uh, we did. Um, um, we, we are in the po process of the replacement of Fire Hall 3 in the Oakville Arena. So if you uh, drive down, you'll see the Oakville Arena is, uh, is uh, coming along. It's on schedule. It's on budget. Um, uh, the Fire Hall has taken up a prominent position in uh, the corner of Kerr Street and Rebecca Street. And if you, uh, if, you, uh, if you look at it, you can see that it is going to be a landmark at that, at that corner. Um, just a, a little personal note on the on the arena. Um, I mean, I've participated so heavily in the development and building of the arena, and I knew we were going to have a roof that was the old roof that some of us, you know, skated under as as kids. And uh, it was so pleasing to me to go in and see this is not just a roof that's there. It looks like the old arena on the inside. It's, it's quite striking and uh, it's a little bit nostalgic. So we have um, what looks to me like the old arena with new ice and new, and it will have new chairs in it. So um, I do want to call attention to that. that that's, I think, a, a significant um, accomplishment, even though we will not finish it until, uh, until next year. The OTMH uh, legacy demolition, um, if you drive by it, uh, on Allen Street, you can see that we are now in a demolition zone. Uh, the building is starting to come down. What used to be the emergency offices are gone. Um, under fiscal sustainability, uh, we are completing the DC background study and we will be bringing that forward early in the new year. Uh, the 2018 budget and uh, related forecast, here we are. Uh, the replacement of the end of life CRM software. Uh, that is one of the smoothest implementations that I have, I have seen. Um, we went live with the new CRM system on the help desk and uh, then a couple of weeks ago we went live on Service Oakville without, without a ripple. Um, um, and, and it is a, a software as a service application which I'll be talking to a little bit more later on. 
Uh, fuel and liquids management, there's a new, new system to meter out fuel and oil and all of the other liquids that are required for fleet. Uh, that's servicing our, uh, our buses and it's also servicing our, uh, the rest of our fleet and it allows us to better track fuel and uh, the uh, individual data about individual vehicles. On, uh, in, two th in 2017, we were able to measure, this is a recurring theme, but we were able to measure energy savings at Oakville Transit Facility. Um, and in 2017, we're saving more than $100,000 over the 2014 benchmark. So all of the improvements that we've been uh, incrementally making, we're able to start to look at, you know, is that really working? And uh, yes, it is. Um, and we did dispose of the Chisholm School lots. Under innovation, um, the uh, arena was built with a new system called Integrated Project Delivery. Uh, this has been used fairly heavily in the US and uh, has been started to be used in uh, Canada. It's a very interesting and I think exciting uh, way to do building projects. What it does is it forces um, the person who is building the facility, the entity that is building the facility to disclose their profit. Having disclosed their profit, if we go over on our timelines or if we go over on expenses, the first place that those expenses go is to contingency and if you exhaust contingency then it starts to eat into the builder profit. So everybody is very, very highly motivated to finish the project on time and it is in as valuable a way as possible. Uh, w w since, since doing this, we've been visited by many, many other municipalities having a look at uh, the benefits of using IPD, which was originally designed to try to bring litigation uh, r around uh, construction projects to, a, to an end. And uh, all of the signs so far is that it's allowing us greater control over the actual spend of the of the, uh, of the money that we are putting into capital uh, purchases. Uh, on the other hand, if they are able to build it to specification ahead of schedule, then that profit is shared among the participants and uh, we get better, val we, we increase our value, we add values into what it is that we're doing. Uh, we designed and, and well, we participated in the design and build of the creation zone at the Oakville Library. Um, and we participated very, very heavily in the library radio frequency identification project that uh, I guess Colleen spoke to. Um, I thought that the RFID project was one of the best projects that I have seen go off in a very long time. Um, it was very carefully measured from beginning to end so that we knew what the efficiencies were and we were able to take those efficiencies and deploy them in other places as we went through the project. Uh, there's a new learning management system going in. Electronic bidding is now operational, which is eliminating a large amount of paper. Um, electronic data ma document management continues to grow. Um, uh, we are putting more and more things uh, into uh, libraries that are indexed and organized as opposed to just having personal directories of things that um, is very difficult to track. And Global Leave is a program that is replacing the manual system that we use for tracking attendance. And at this point, about 67% of eligible staff are now having their attendance tracked uh, uh, online as opposed to filling out a, a, a green sheet every, every week. Uh, there are large portions of the organization this does not apply to, but um, uh, for that group that is applicable, uh, we're at about 70% penetration. Under good governance, um, uh, we are well into the preparation for the 2018 election. Um, I know that we have not even come close to nomination day yet, but uh, voting machines are being reserved, uh, secure areas are being set up, um, uh, polling stations are being uh, um, uh, leased so that uh, the election will run off without a hitch. It's a very large project running an election. Uh, council chamber renovation, all being well, in preparation for the seventh ward, will be uh, going ahead in uh, 2018. And um, I, I mentioned here, I, I mentioned here that we have more than 100 MFIPA FOI requests. These are very significant requests. We have two people who are working almost steadily 
on uh, filling out AMFIPA requests. They've gone from something that was, if you have the record, you need to show it to us, to we're seeing them being used as corporate weapons quite often. So we will get requests for all of the information about um, some particular site and people will spend weeks um, developing a response to that in keeping with the legislation. And this does not account for the more than 1,000 or so uh, FOI requests that the building department gets for, um, for drawings every year. Uh, we are looking at ways to improve that, but um, I think this is a significant uh, milestone. In 2018, our key initiatives um, under accountability, uh, we will be uh, supporting the uh, leadership plan, uh, which um, um, is coming to us in 2018, specifically uh, around program reviews and around uh, building a dynamic workforce. Uh, the legal department will continue to vigorously defend and advance the town's position. Um, under fiscal sustainability, we'll have another uh, DC bylaw. Um, uh, next year, we will be bringing forward a long-term financial forecast. So the capital forecast for this year is 2018. And then uh, next year, it will be the return to the 2018 when the DC forecast is done. Uh, we will complete a number of strategic acquisitions. This is talking directly to uh, the Kerr Street grade separation and the, and the, and the uh, uh, Spears Road widening, among other things. Uh, there will be acquisitions and expropriations going on. Uh, through our legal and realty services department. Under innovation, um, we would like to uh, use automation to increase the efficiency of recruitment and learning. Uh, we want to develop customized uh, management dashboards to show uh, how we are progressing through the year. Right now, um, while it's semi-automated, uh, we, we would like to take further steps to make that uh, more automated. Uh, it's been mentioned that we uh, achieved platinum status for uh, the um, uh, ISO 37120 uh, uh, legis uh, standard. Uh, this is the World Council on Data, Open Data, and our goal is to achieve that uh, once again next year. Um, that means we will be gathering 100 measures uh, for our town and we can measure ourselves against uh, every other uh, community who does that. Um, I, think, uh, I think it's in the range of about 100 or so communities worldwide. Uh, so we can measure ourselves against communities like London, Helsinki, um, and we measure up remarkably well. There's two that stood out to me. Uh, one was, of all of the communities that were measured, we have more green space than any other community except Helsinki. Um, I wondered uh, that Helsinki, you know, had that much green space. And the other thing that was really quite striking was um, the number of patents that are held by residents of Oakville. Now, you know, holding a patent is a big deal. Um, you, 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 don't, you don't get to file a patent unless you're doing some pretty innovative research. And Oakville is measuring up against like these really big cities and measuring really, really well. So if you haven't gone through the data carefully, um, I'd recommend that you have a look because it's quite striking. Uh, oh, and under innovation, we'll be advancing the development of the former public works lands. Um, so um, this is uh, one of the projects that legal will be shepherding uh, through. Um, by helping us with our Municipal Development Corporation subject to the appropriate approvals from Council. And under good governance, um, you know, we'll be doing an election this year and uh, uh, the asset management plans will be coming to uh, ministry guidelines. Um, I was asked to speak, oh, um, I did say that I would speak about uh, program cost drivers. And so, um, if you look at our graphs of what we spent money on, um, I'm quite proud of the fact that most of our programs have remained quite stable. You will see very marginal increases, and those are mainly due to um, salary increases. You know, the, 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 the contract has incremented us up by a percent or a percent and a half or, or so. And so that's reflected in those graphs. But if you look at IT, um, you will see that um, uh, there was a, a, an increase of 9.1%, which is mainly attributable to an increase of $890,000, which fell to software as a service and software maintenance. 
So um, many, many software companies are eliminating their on-premise service, and um, that's happening to the big and the small at the same time. Um, if I can give an example, if you want to use um, uh, a package like Microsoft Word or Excel on your cell phone or your iPad, there's a very good chance that you're going to have to get a, uh, a cloud account so that you can get your data from wherever it is. Uh, the, app the application itself might cost $2, or it might be free, but the account for the cloud costs you $10 a month. So you're paying 120 bucks a year, and um, over three years, that's probably paying the equivalent that you would pay for a for a uh, micro-based uh, uh, word processing account. Well, that's happening on the big scale, too. Uh, so uh, what you can see here in this uh, little example is the cloud is where most of the servers and most of the major software is residing, and then it gets passed on to you for a monthly subscription fee or to us for a monthly subscription fee. The beauty of it is um, they're always up to date. The applications are always up to date. And um, uh, they undertake, although there's been many examples of uh, serious failures, but the cloud service undertakes to put in uh, very strong uh, protection. Um, and we know when that fails. But as a matter of course, um, it means that we don't have to make the same investment in, in protecting our servers as we would if uh, we had the sole responsibility for protection. And as I've said, although there are benefits, it's, it's, a, it's an expense, and it's not one we can easily get away from. <clears throat> I've just listed the, uh, the, the services that we have going for us now. The largest one by far is Salesforce, which was the software that we used for our, for our service counter and for the help desk. But you can see there are a number of others, uh, museum, pre-emergency, pre um, Diligent, which some of you are using for your iPads as a subscription, our recruitment management, our theater software, uh, some of our um, library analytics, the Enveronics uh, that uh, Colleen was talking about, uh, being able to gather that data, that's a subscription. Just to give you a taste of, uh, of how software as a service is, is uh, developing. So there's the graph uh, that shows, you know, um, political governance is about the same. It's up a little bit. Uh, information systems is up by the 800,000 that I told you about. Financial services, facilities and construction management. Regulatory services, which is the branch of the clerk's office that sells the licenses, actually brings in more revenue than it uses. Uh, human resources and uh, legal services are all as you would expect in a time of constraint and uh, we have had to uh, deal with um, the software as a service issue in uh, information systems. Our gross operating budget is 32 million and um, uh, our net operating budget is 27. Uh, we don't have very many opportunities for making revenue, although we do have money coming in through licensing. And uh, a little bit comes into information systems, and there's a sprinkling here and there, but by and large, um, uh, we are a tax-based commission. There you can see that almost all of our, all of our um, resources go towards paying our staff. Uh, about 71% goes to personnel and benefits, and then uh, the remainder is fairly marginal. Uh, purchase services, that's uh, the IT infrastructure and so on is in, is in there. Uh, there's the breakdown of gross versus net. Um, the, as I've, I've outlined, uh, the savings are, are fairly marginal when you net off what we are making, so um, there's not much point in spending much time on this. Looking to the future, um, if we look to the future, I, I believe the major issue is complexity. Um, the issues that we're dealing with are all increasing in complexity. Uh, you know, you, 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 I said here, com increasingly complex legal files. You know, if you go back 10 years and you think about what legal was dealing with, and now you look at what they're dealing with today, I mean, we've gone through the gas plant and now we're going through the Glen Abbey, and it's really, it's really a, a, a serious, um, issue. It's, 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 everything is getting more uh, complicated. 
Uh, realty files are becoming more complicated. Um, cash in lieu calculations are becoming more calculated and more contested. Increasingly complex building projects, the, uh, the Southeast Community Centre has been as complicated a project as you can find. It's uh, required resources from planning, it's required resources from community services, and it's required resources from uh, corporate services. There have been numerous contracts negotiated. Um, there have been um, scheduling issues. There have been community outreach issues. It's just we're living in a more complex, a complex world. And, and a recurring theme today has been the request for um, complex data and information. Um, as the organization becomes a more data-based organization, in the back rooms it means you have to provide more connections for people to connect the financial database to the um, uh, for, to the uh, registration database. So, uh, you know, how much money is actually coming back and where exactly is it flowing is becoming something that we need to do to run our businesses better. And uh, that means um, greater complexity. Under fiscal pressures, um, Ray mentioned a couple of them uh, a few minutes ago. Um, we have operating costs to deal with with new facilities. We've got um, the uh, Trafalgar Park coming on. Uh, we have new fire halls coming on. We have uh, Southeast Community Centre coming on. These are big ticket items and uh, we are constrained by um, uh, inflation. Um, we have a strategic asset management policy which is going to invite us to compare um, what we're spending on one asset to what we're spending on another asset. And it's going to ask us to do that comparison in a rational, in a rational way. And um, I, think, I think that is going to be a challenging process as we, as we um, move in that sort of direction of prioritizing across all of our, all of our, our, uh, our resources. Uh, service levels versus inflation. Uh, we all want to do the best. We all want to provide the best service that we can to our community. Uh, but, um, you know, there has to be some limits imposed on that uh, if we are going to stick within the guidelines of inflation. And uh, uh, asset management strategies, I've really already addressed that when I talked about strategic asset management policy. So that brings us to reports and referrals on Monday night. I promised to bring back some information on the council chamber renovation. So I have three slides to deal with that. Um, this um, slide is um, a slide that outlines two things. It outlines the area of slope in the um, it outlines the area of slope in the in the chamber, and it outlines the areas where we are not in compliance with AODA legislation. So the room is not compliant with AODA legislation. The slope issue probably demands um, some special attention. There are three codes that deal with um, slopes. We have our own Oakville Universal Design Standard, which requires a one in 20, um, a one in 20 slope. We are not compelled by provincial law to follow our OUD uh, guidelines. We try to at every turn. Um, the AODA lists that you need a 1 in 20 slope for exterior ramps, but it's silent on, on interior ramps. And the Ontario Building Code recognizes a 1 in 12 slope is permissible under code. So you will see that, well, what it is is a gray matter and a subject of considerable debate among people who have to deal with that with that legislation, and sometimes there are compromises. So you will see in the next slide a compromise, but I do want to call your attention to the red circles. Uh, the first uh, one is um, this corridor where I'm standing is uh, not AODA compliant. There's a stair here. Uh, you cannot get a wheelchair down that stair. Um, if you go to the um, center aisle, the, um, there are two uh, turning radiuses that are outlined there. Um, the uh, turning radiuses are not AODA compliant, partly because they're not big enough at the top, and secondly, 
Uh, if we were to require a turning radius, which when we designed this room in 2003, four, we had envisioned that people would be able to come down here in a wheelchair. The problem is they would have to turn their wheelchair um, on a slope that is a one in 12 slope, or even if it was a one in 20 slope, it would not be AODA compliant. You cannot ask a person to turn their wheelchair around on a sloped surface. And then if you go over to this area, which is uh, uh, identified that you would have to have a wheelchair turn on that slope as well, which is not AODA compliant. So we cannot get people to the front of this room in compliance with AODA considerations. Um, then when we come down into this area where we are, uh, we do have a minimum turning radius. That's the red, uh, that's the red uh, circle at the uh, sort of the upper edge. It's down in this area here. We could bring a wheelchair down and we could turn it in there. Um, um, I've already talked about the ramp here or the step here is not um, AOD compliant. And um, the distance between the bench over here and the, um, and the first counselor position is also not AODA compliant. We have a staircase in the back hall, which requires steps, which are not AODA compliant. Uh, so really, when you're thinking about this th stuff, the way I think about it is, if a person required a wheelchair, could they conduct their business um, with dignity and have the same opportunities as everybody else? Um, so having said all that, um, this is the compromise that we came up with um, for the council chambers in the previous design. In a few minutes, I'm going to show you a new design that over the last two days we've constructed uh, due to the comments on uh, the request for uh, ward partners to be able to sit next to each other and due to the observation that we were reducing the number of seating in the, public, in the public galleries. So this was the plan that we had in place on Monday. And uh, you can see that we are now reducing the size of the slope. So the slopes are still there. The slopes are code compliant, but we have brought the room into AODA compliance by moving the flat floor back so that when you come down to speak at the front of the room, you have a turning radius. A person in a wheelchair can turn after making their presentation and wheel their way upstairs as needed. There is an adequate turning radius at the top of the room, and we have a turning radius down here at the front of the room. Um, we have removed the bench that the chairman of the budget committee, I'm sorry, the step that the chairman of the budget committee is, uh, is seated on um, because that's not compliant. So that will be, that will be eliminated. So this area uh, becomes compliant. Um, we had uh, made adjustments to put uh, a replacement of this judge's dais so that it was a one in 12 slope so that if people wanted entry or exit through this door or through that door, it would be it would be available. The cost for that, for those, and this is very difficult and um, it's a little bit elusive. So the cost, as best we could calculate them at the request of council on Monday night, is about $275,000 for AODA compliance. However, that's an estimate and we've done our best to um, say what we think the real honest to goodness costs of AODA compliance are. But it's tied to so many different things. So for example, the length of the benches have to change to make uh, the side uh, access points um, uh, available uh, for the width of a wheelchair. Should you claim every bench or not? Should we claim the entire floor or not? So we went through a very detailed analysis and came up with those things that we thought were specifically needed for AODA compliance. And out of the, uh, out of the entire project, we felt that about $275,000 were attributable to AODA specifically. 
Um, I would call your attention to the fact that we did not include any IT infrastructure in there. There is a plan for IT infrastructure um, that will make it more accessible, but we didn't cost any of that into the 275000 because it's just too hard to extract out. If you're going to buy a package, uh, you buy the package and the compliance comes, comes with it. Um, I would like to note as well that um, one of the things we are doing is we are using the council closure to do some, um, many, uh, state of good repair repairs. So we don't get many chances to close council chamber, and when we do, it's a fairly significant disruption. So um, when we are closing it to put in the new, um, the new benches, uh, which is a small part of the budget, our intention is to use that time to put in new uh, information systems, uh, which um, uh, are aging at, at, uh, at best. They are 12 years old, and um, you know, think about how old your oldest television set is in your, in your, in your house. 12 years is a long time to keep uh, infrastructure up. If we don't do it now, you know, we will do it in the foreseeable future uh, because we must. The same is true of the HVAC system. It's just an opportunity for us to put all of these uh, uh, elements together. So we're using the closing of the chamber as an advantage for us to carry out state of good repairs. Um, I did look up the last, um, the last uh, renovation of council, and um, it was $1.1 million, and it was done in late 2005. And the original estimate was for um, $1.6 million, and I had completely forgotten that we were going to put a balcony up here. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but, oh, yeah. but I, had, I had forgotten about that completely. So uh, we took the balcony out, and uh, we've got a projector there instead. Uh, there was uh, another report in 2012, but it did not materialize in this room. So then, this is the work of Tuesday and Wednesday. What we did was we um, asked our uh, architect and uh, a number of internal staff to come up with a plan that would meet the shortcomings that I heard on Monday night. And they were made of two families. One was, um, how can we reduce the public staff or the public seating? So the only way that we could get the public seating up was to put more benches in. So what we have done is we have pushed the dais out and moved the U back. So everything is shifted back about three feet. Some of these walls will come down. I want to emphasize this is conceptual. This is conceptual drawing only. Um, so there will be um, elements, of, elements of, of change coming. But if we do that, we can, depends on how you count, uh, but we can um, take our 153 seats that we did have, by some measures 146 and by others 150, but um, let's say it's 153 and we can duplicate 153 seats in bench seating back here. So we have the same amount of seating um, in the new chamber as we do in this one. And um, the second thing we've done is if you count the, the, the V there, of uh, council tables, uh, there are seven on one side and eight on the other. The one closest to the mayor would become the clerk's table, and we have to make it so that it does not appear to be a council table. We'll do some finishing or something to make sure that people know it's the clerk. Um, but that allowed us to get at a reasonable level of symmetry, although it's not completely symmetrical. Unless you're looking down from the attic, I think it's, uh, I think it's a pretty good job. Um, so there are some structural beams back here that have to stay in place, uh, but um, the dais will be washed out and we'll use that space for, uh, for council. Um, oh, and it came up as well, uh, people were concerned about can I see what's going on in the overflow area? I pointed out that the overflow area would be better, and yes, uh, I have verified it. I was absolutely certain on Monday night, but we have gone back to the provider and picture in picture, of the of the uh, the south atrium is certainly possible, um, easily doable, and uh, we will equip that facility with a microphone and a podium in case anybody wants to speak from there. Um, but um, 
we'll, we'll see how heavily used that is. So that's, uh, that's my referral piece. And now if I can go to capital project highlights. These have been mentioned by other people, but as I said, um, corporate services is so deeply involved. And uh, I just want to point out uh, that Fogger Park um, will be completed this year. Uh, it's a $21 million project. It's uh, drawing to a close. And, um, um, you know, that's, that's been a joint effort by mainly, mainly two commissions to design and develop and build that thing on time. The OTMH teardown and the um, Southeast Community Center building design, there's about 10 million allocated in this year. I think it came under um, recreation culture. But uh, if you have a chance, if you can drive down Allen Street and take a look through the gate, which is about the only way you can, you can see in now, our old emergency uh, access is gone and uh, they're tearing the insides out of the building and it will gradually progress until uh, the building is completely, completely demolished. That's proceeding on schedule. Uh, we will see more hoarding, nice hoarding, go up uh, uh, over the course of this month. It's, uh, it's permanent. Uh, it'll be cemented in. It will be level. Uh, it will be plumb. And um, uh, it will be there throughout the tear down and construction of the, of the, new, of the new facility. Uh, Glen Abbey Creation Hub and Renovation, this is a library project, uh, but we will be deeply involved in the teardown and the build and design aspects of it. We're going to have a North Park Temporary Library branch going up. We will be participating heavily in that. Uh, then some of the stuff that does not normally face the public. We've got the HVAC and roof replacements. We do so many every year. Uh, we have the uh, council chamber, which I've just spoken about at length, uh, hardware evergreening, and energy management at various facilities. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the transit story I told you is kind of a nice, a nice story. Uh, corporate initiatives, we're a small piece of the pie. Uh, but we um, participate in um, many of the other pieces of the pie. And uh, uh, here are our initiatives, mainly their infrastructure renew. Newell, there are some strategic projects such as web-based services, corporate document management, a mandate public portal, and so on that are uh, strategic initiatives. And that brings me to questions. Very good. Councilor Elgar. Thank you very much. Um, Monday evening, I was pretty disappointed uh, with what I heard about redoing the council chambers uh, because I, th I did remember a lot of work being done here, design and getting it implemented with the redesign of uh, this council chamber in the 03 to 06 period. And I remember specifically about slopes and everything. And at the presentation on Monday, I heard the slopes were all completely wrong. So Tuesday, I took the time to get the building code, and I, I, and I know you're aware of that. So I went, got the building code, got my tape measure, got a laser, I did the slope. And I was happy to see that what we put in back in 2003 was in fact totally compliant with the Accessible Ontario Disabilities Act, which was not in force until 2005. But we as a council wanted to, we knew it was coming. And it, so it became compliant, which was a, then that was a bit of a shock. So I did talk to staff. I tried to get them that night, and I talked to them this morning, and, and that's when they told me, yes, you're absolutely correct. We are 100% uh, compliant with the slope, except, except for the, the step right in front of us here. Which, and, but there is a ramp in there, so it is compliant also. So the only problem then became up at the top, there's a couple of locations where we want to put in uh, two... Uh, accessible wheelchair places, and also down here at the speaker podium. And you can see to, the, to my right of the speaker podium, where nobody ever sits, where David Lee sits uh, from the Oakville uh, Beaver, that could be easily modified. And it was very, so it was very, very concerned that we are looking at putting up, leveling the floor, which we don't really need to do at all, chain, taking all of the benches out, and redoing them when it's so easy to saw off a couple of benches uh, and let the uh, uh, two spaces up at the top and down at the bottom also. And we could also get councillors to <coughs> come down the middle aisle if their wheelchair, because that was a big thing about uh, could be a councillor in a wheelchair, which is quite possible. 
And so I, I really have great, and then yesterday I get a call from uh, not one, but a few, because it was in the Oakville Beaver, saying, what are you wasting money on in big time right now when in fact apparently the long-term plan is to redesign Cross Avenue and they're saying it has the plans for a new town hall down in that area off Trafalgar. So like I'm getting calls on that, like, what, what are we, why are you wasting all the money? And I'm having trouble explaining to the residents why we would be spending, and as you, you said 2.2 million, and I think it's two two million oh sixty five or something, but the other quarter of a million is for a new uh, projection system in the south uh, atrium. Then I get another call saying, "Well, we, we have events in the south atrium, so you're going to put in permanent bench seating. I can't. We won't be able to get t for certain events. Won't be able to get tables everywhere." I, I guess I go back to asking staff to make it compliant for turning radiuses, which to me is very simple. A skill saw could fix that very fast. Um, and seeing what we can do to minimize the amount of money we as a council spend, which is not our money, it's the public's money we're spending. So I'm hoping that we can come up with something much, much more reasonable and still make it totally uh, accessible, Ontario Disability Act compliant going forward for, the, for whatever term we remain here. You've raised a number of issues. I'll try to deal with them. First of all, the room is not AODA compliant. <clears throat> There's a stair here that um, makes problems for us. There's a stair here. There's a stair there. If you put more benches in, there's no accessibility to behind the benches. The room is not AODA compliant. The slopes, in absence of AODA, we revert to the building code. So um, our universal design standard says one in 20. I believe that the AODA being silent was not intentional. They've named one in 20 on the outside. Um, they forgot to name it on the inside, or maybe it was intentional. The building code says one in 12, so we are compliant with the building code on that slope. But the room is not AODA compliant. Um, and the, the non-compliance is not because of the slope. It's because of other things, mainly cement ledges and so on. And we have to be able to put in a new bench here and a new bench there, or maybe two benches on one side, which is um, a, significant, a significant issue. The scheduling for the demolition of this building, I think it's quite interesting if you were to draw a bullseye on the top of the building, we couldn't have the road directed through it more perfectly, but that's not likely to happen for 25 years, which is a long time. <clears throat> we do have to run council meetings in the, in, the, in the long haul, and it is very conceivable that we will have um, uh, people who need um, uh, AODA accessible um, meeting space and presentation space. Um, the cost of the room, as I've tried to outline, is not just to put two more benches in. If you look at the budget for the millwork, it's around about thirty or forty thousand dollars for the millwork. The millwork is not the big deal. We are using the closing of the facility to do um, um, uh, upkeep of the room. So um, at some point in the very foreseeable future, the software and the hardware that you're using on these systems is going to have to be removed and replaced. Um, that was not a plot on Monday night when the, uh, when the microphones weren't working very well. People are doing handsprings behind the scenes to keep them going, keep them balanced. We have people coming in regularly to try and try and balance them. Um, the streaming, uh, the, the closed captioning and so on is all up for repair. So what better time to fix the IT infrastructure than while the room is out of commission? The same is true for HVAC and other considerations. It is an opportunity for us to do state of good repair maintenance to this room. If people think that the only, the only thing that's getting done with that price is we're putting two new benches in, then they're oversimplifying. There's a half a million dollars or so of information systems infrastructure. There's a couple hundred thousand dollars of um, HVAC, and uh, there are some other activities that are, that are going on. Um, so I think I've responded to most of, most of your points. 
Well, on the question of, of uh, millwork, I find that interesting because Monday night you said it was 204000 for millwork. I had grouped all of those estimates together uh, to try and simplify things for uh, council. And as I said, it's all quite integrated, but the actual purchase of these desks here is about $30,000. So in, in fairness, we could, in fact, add two seats, one there and one over there, but then the mayor would have to be up top, correct? Inaccessibly. That, that inaccessibly, we could put a lift in. I suppose if you wanted to do that, right. you, you could, could but we have done our best to provide you with a council chamber that you can be pleased to work in and feel comfortable in. And, and for the cabling, uh, it, was a, it was a huge amount of money for the cabling, and I, I, I honestly couldn't figure that out at all. Like it was a huge amount of money, I thought you said, for, for cabling in for all this new technology also. And, mm -hmm. I, and I guess I worked for Bell Canada for 30 years, and I know a little bit about cabling, and I know how you can do saw cuts and concrete and put conduits in and run an awful lot of cables into switching centers. So, like, I just think this is a Cadillac, and I, I don't think we need it, and I don't think the residents want it, but uh, I guess we'll find out later. But I, I think that uh, this is really the Cadillac that we as a council, uh, personally myself, I don't want it. I want the money. If we need money, if we have lots of surplus money, I say let's give it to some, where the people really need it. So I thank you. I don't think there are any questions in there. Councillor Grant? Thank you, through Mr. Chair. I don't have questions about the council chamber. Um, <clears throat> on uh, Tuesday, we talked a bit about budget pressures and uh, brought up was the minimum wage increase. Um, I was hoping we'd cover a bit of that today, but uh, we didn't get a chance to. Uh, I guess the question I have is there was a discussion at the time on Tuesday on how some of the part-time people, some of the lower wage people would possibly lose their jobs or that we wouldn't be hiring more. And, and I have a concern if we're going to be doing something along those lines. I mean, the, uh, a lot of those jobs are, are young people, and it's not just a job, I find, but it's actually a good educational experience for a lot of the youth leaders that we've got in the community. It's a good first job for these people to kind of get on a path to really make something better themselves and lead. So uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if we could have a bit of a conversation about that, if we're gonna be losing any jobs to, say, technology. Well, I, I may have to ask our director of HR to come down if I blow it. But um, uh, our philosophy is not to lay off to compensate for the w minimum wage increase. Uh, we did a considerable amount of work to look at our part-time grids. I think the original cost that we estimated if we shifted everything up was, was about $1.4 million. Um, uh, that deals with all of the compression issues and so on that have come up. We restructured the grid and reduced that to 1.1 million. Um, but our intention was to um, hire the same. We are not going to use uh, reductions in student help to offset that um, at this point. Having said that, <laughs> um, um, we are going to be looking at all of our programs to see if there are better ways to do it to do them, but it will not be as a consequence of the wage reduction. Uh, we have adjusted, I think the people in recreation and culture who are the hardest hit uh, have, have done some fee adjustments to try and comp compensate for that. And um, um, uh, parks uh, have another large cohort of students. Um, we are actually quite lucky in that the only um, the only part of our organization that is touched by the minimum wage is our student population, which is, which is fairly contained. Um, you know, everybody else is making more than the minimum wage. So I just, I just uh, want to reiterate, that was not our intention, was to, to reduce staff to accommodate that. We're looking for other ways. Okay, excellent. And uh, so nobody's being replaced by technology. On the bright side of technology then, perhaps. Um, when we're talking about some of these programs uh, that were some of the software as a service programs, um, is there any way that we're recovering costs or could recover costs in the future now? I'm, I'm thinking specifically of Diligent where possibly in the future we would not have to print reams of these. We could actually have this electronic document. 
Is there any kind of other savings that we can see from using these services? I think we are slowly whittling away at the paper, um, the paper battle. Um, you know, um, it's, I've, I found over the years it's much easier to put something new in place than to take away something old. And um, the battle to get rid of paper is going to be a very long one, uh, but we are, we are engaged. I think there are substantial efficiencies to um, the further automation of things. I've been a very heavy, diligent user since uh, it came out. I just make it my business to, to, to embrace it. And now, if I want to search for something, I go into diligent and I use the search tool and it's all right there and I can find it really easily. And that probably saves me more in time than I could ever hope to achieve in paper, paper savings. The same is true of the um, electronic, electronic data management that I was telling you about. We're gradually moving our files, so you used to have a P drive, a personal drive, and you would store everything there and you would have a file name. With EDM, um, it gets stored actually into, um, call it a, an intranet, um, and you can index it. So I've been storing my files on the electronic data management system for some time, probably about two years. So if I want to see all of the licenses that I've participated in, I can call up all licenses or anything to do with Lindbrook School, which uh, comes up from time to time. So I can get all of the files tagged Lindbrook. Um, and once again, that's making me more efficient in, uh, in my data. And I think that's what the promise is. So again, even though um, you're basically funded by taxes, there, there are some efficiencies that can be found and possibly, hopefully, savings at some point. In, in man hours at least, or person hours, sorry. Absolutely, I, I, think, I think, you know, if, if, I think automation does avoid costs in the fullness of time. Thank you very much. Councillor Chisholm. And no. Okay, thank you. Um, this has been the HR. Just a question, and just for clarity uh, for this. Uh, in your net program budget change, you're decreasing by 379000 due to positions, movements of one advisory manager and two HR consultants into a reorganization to advisory services. Is this, uh, is this upcoming? Is this a new department or a unit? No, we've, we've, we've completed that. So HR has reorganized itself, and the, the framework for reorganization was um, as limited new resources as possible. So put some positions were um, left vacant, and we replaced them with a new manager of client services, and uh, she is in place and has been, has been working now. We did the same thing in information systems with very large spans of control. We wanted to get a supervisory level in, so we, we, we used the resources that we had to reorganize and do that. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Noll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very, very quick question. I just noted, uh, as uh, Councillor Duddick did beside me, the um, Council Chamber's renovation budget seemed to have gone down in the slide presentation from the original one. Can you explain the difference? Yes. <clears throat> the budget that you're seeing is about 1.9 million. I think that's what it's rounded off to. Uh, that is the budget for the um, the state of good repair and AODA issues that I have been talking about. In our Monday night, I wanted Council to see um, a picture of what the entire costs were. So I had included our design costs, which is the architect that was helping us with the new design, and I had included uh, the, the projector costs for the new atrium because I thought, you know, you, you want to see the whole ball of wax. So uh, that accounts for the difference between the 2.25 I think I was talking about on Monday and the 1.9 that you're getting today. Thank you. Councillor Listrina. Uh, just a quick follow-up on the HR uh, question here. Uh, back to the KPIs. Uh, number five, claims settled prior to grievance arbitration. Uh, there was significant drop there. Is this a blip or are you anticipating uh, that kind of number down the road? Oh, that's in their particular KPI. Could you, would you mind just telling me what it said again? Uh, number five KPI under human resources claims yes. settled prior to uh, grievance arbitration. The, the change from the last 
two years to 2017? Um, we have had more grievances in 2017 than we experienced in, in, in previous years. Um, uh, the, the number has gone up. Um, uh, we have uh, entered a, a sort of a different, uh, different regime. Um, so we've had um, a number of grievances come from uh, uh, QP 136, <clears throat> more than we have ever had, more than we have ever had before. And uh, we have had more from QP 11329 uh, than we have had in past years. I think part of the reason is um, the organization is, is changing, and as a result, we're getting grievances from the union that um, we did not receive in past years. Um, I hope it's a blip. Um, we've been working hard to try and make it a blip, but it may be the state of things to come. We may have a greater degree of, of uh, labor unrest than we are used to. Others? Okay, uh, can I ask you, let's go back to our favorite topic of the day, council chambers. Can you tell me what was included in the 1.1 million of work that was done in the 2005 period? Yes. And I do remember the discussion of the balcony and as I said the other night, it was a, just a ridiculous amount of um, fight over all the different bits and pieces. I remember going back and forth many times. The, uh, the real serious stuff was going on with the with courts. So in, in 2005, we spent 350000 on construction, demolition, furniture, and equipment. We spent 300000 on IT and AV, audiovisual equipment. We spent 70000 on millwork. Um, we spent one hundred and 80,000 on design costs, soft costs, and miscellaneous costs. And we spent, there was 200,000 in contingency. Um, without going back and checking the accounts, I can't tell how much of the contingency we spent, but usually you spend most of it. So that accounts for the $1.1 million. Uh, and the cost of the balcony was 500,000. Mr. Green, did you have something to add there? Perhaps, uh, Mr. Chair, if the committee would indulge me, I, I just want to make a few comments on the council chamber. I feel somewhat compelled to make uh, a few comments. And, and first of all, um, certainly if council wants to reduce the scope, that is something that can be accommodated. On, on the same token, um, you know, we've labeled it all under council chambers. Perhaps that's uh, uh, unfortunate because it is state of good repair. It is technology. So, I mean, when I look at here, the project could be reduced, but I think some of the things that have to be done, like why would you renovate or why would you do any changes in here without doing the uh, HVAC system? It's an old, remember, much of that dates back over 30 years old, that equipment up there. Also, if you look at this council chamber, which was a courtroom at one time, and when we did the changes back in, in 2004, 2005, again, with the slopes and everything we had to work with, we had to keep a functional courtroom and keep, so there was compromises. Otherwise, if, if this had been, from the beginning of time, a normal council chamber, we wouldn't be even talking about the floors. And while, you know, you could chop the ends off benches to make it, com to improve the compliance, remember, AODA standards are a minimum standard. They're not necessarily what one should do to accommodate people. And I think that's something you really need to recognize. Uh, I think back to the uh, evening of the um, Glen Abbey back in, I think it was the end of August we were here. I was helping people with their... If, in fact, if you watch the, about 10 minutes before the council meeting starts, because I know that's on the YouTube, you will see me helping people with their, with their walkers and, and one chip job with his Moby Dick, trying to get them in place in a crowded room. So yes, OEDA, when it's an empty chamber and people can move around, sure. But you put a crowd in this room, and the thing is, we are having crowds now. 
And I don't see that stopping for any time soon, especially with a new, you know, with a new uh, OMB regime, new council, new OP, concerns about uh, committee of adjustment. We will pack this council chamber. I have no doubts about that. You're, you're putting a council chamber that's going to be here for 15, perhaps 20 years. I look at the Toronto Star today, and if I was going to be outraged as a taxpayer, I would be outraged with the federal government that's spending $5.6 million on an outdoor uh, ice rink that's going to last for 26 days. So $2.2 million or $2 million, whichever it is, Gord, you're getting state of good repair. You're going to put some comfort in here for the people that will be coming in this council chamber. So what do the public get? They get somewhere to sit here, and they're going to be in the atrium. We know they're going to be in the atrium. So I, I just don't think once, as I said, if, if council, the will of council is to scale it back, obviously we'll scale it back to whatever number. Your budget number, even in the forecast, going in for the last couple of years was $1.5 million. So yes, it's up to $2 million because we're getting into the final estimates. But this is not new. It includes state of good repair, it includes energy efficiency, it includes AODA, technology upgrades, and public convenience. I think you have to look at all of those as what you're getting for that $2 million. So, again, if that is not seen to be worth it, then we can scale it back. But I don't think you should minimize what is being provided in that estimate. It will serve you for many years, and it gets out of being an old courtroom. Thank you for that. A um, couple of additional questions for you. Uh, earlier you said that uh, we're probably looking at 25 years out before we're demolishing Town Hall. Um, thank you for that estimate. Uh, it'll <laughs> Sorry I gave it. I have no basis for that. It's just what I think is going to happen. I've, I've long thought it was going to be f far off in the distant future. Um, and, and whether it's 25 or plus or minus, but um, I've always thought it was going to be farther out. When and if that day ever comes around where Town Hall does get uh, demolished and moved somewhere, we don't, haven't concluded as to what might happen, um, what happens to the cost of the new Town Hall? Does it get covered entirely by the cost of the road project and therefore get covered through development charges? It's very preliminary to answer that, but the DC Act is pretty clear. You can't use DCs to cover administration. Um, there are open questions on can you use a DC to cover administration of parks that we will have to get into as we creep up on that, on that problem. But I think the general answer is it will be, we will not be very heavily reliant on DCs for a, for a new town hall. So if so if Town Hall gets demolished because of a DC project, we don't get to get it back? Mr. Green? Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Lalone is quite correct. Actually, using DCs explicitly raised to pay for a new Town Hall it cannot be done under the legislation. However, if as a result of growth in transportation, there is a need for a new right-of-way to come up through here. There is opportunities to recapture costs, not only for the land, but for the fact that we would have to move Town Hall to do it. So I believe there would be opportunities in a future DC. Who knows how the legislation might change, though, over the next 5, 10, 15 years. But I believe there would be arguments to be made that part of the injurious affection, because we are a landowner, and normally when a landowner has property taken, there is a factor of injurious affection. I think that could be a compensation to us, even under the DCs. I'd certainly want to argue it. That's always been my thought on it. I, and, if it's, and if that's not the case, then um, forget this road project. We're doing something else, in my opinion. Because, <laughs> I, I mean, replacing Town Hall is a... Uh, you know, $100 million kind of project. It's a giant project. Yeah. Um, and in the meantime, between now and 15 or 25 years from now, there's a whole bunch of other renovation work that's planned in our capital plan for work at Town Hall. Can you tell me in the 10-year capital plan 
how many dollars are intended to be spent on accommodation work and other work at Town Hall? That is a line in our budget. I don't have it on the top of my head, but we can we can look it up. And, and I think it, it shows up in several different places. If yeah. I'm yeah, we we can get that. I just can't give it to you right now. But I, my point is that I think there's a whole bunch of other dollars being spent on Town Hall that. If the if the concern is that we ought not to spend money on the council chamber because we're going to tear down town hall, there's a whole bunch of other money that is also being spent on this location that falls in that same category. True. And are you going to get rid of all those projects too? That's true. That's my question. Um, okay. You showed us uh, three different diagrams of council chambers. Yes. I think one of them was the original, one is, so this, you've got current. This is the way it looks now. You've got um, the one that you showed us the other night. This is the one that we proposed the other night. And this one is an alteration that I think meets the concerns of not enough gallery space and Councillors wanted to sit together. So on the one side, there are eight stations, so we can sit four wards together on the, on the bottom of the U and three wards together on the top of the U. Uh, and the station next to the mayor's station would be used for the clerk. So what is the status of this design? So you showed us one on the other day and uh, you got a whole bunch of feedback, and I appreciate that staff have taken that feedback and tried to amend or modify the design. What's the status of this, and um, how do we? How does council know what we're ultimately going to get? If assuming the this budget passed for the program, I, I was thinking about that. I thought it might not be a bad idea to bring a report back. In staff's mind, this is a it, this is a better design, the one that I have just uh, provided to you. Um, it meets the needs of more galleries, a uh, more gallery, and it meets the needs of uh, of, of uh, councillors to sit together with their wards. I do not think that the changes to the original budget would be substantial, but I thought I should probably bring that back uh, very shortly with this ratified as a design or proposed as a design with the associated costing, which I don't think are going to change much. So you haven't costed this one out, but it's plus or minus 10% or something yeah, like that? Yeah, it's, that... it's, it's, it's not a big ticket item. As I said, the IT infrastructure remains the same. Well, I didn't say it. But the IT infrastructure remains the same. The HVAC remains the, remains the same. Um, the AODA stuff remains substantially the same, although there's some um, conundrums back here in this, in this hallway that we would have to deal with. Uh, so I don't think that the changes, we have to tear down another wall is, is mainly what they are. So I would like to be able to reassess the costs and, and provide them to council. What process would you propose to us for that? Bring a report back as soon as possible because the time is, is marching on. So would that be something you'd bring back to the, this committee or how would you like to do uh, that? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, exactly. I think we should come back and establish what the budget's going to be what um, what the recommendation would be, the final floor layout, and then I would respectfully suggest wherever the budget committee lands on that last meeting, which I believe is December the 12th, you would then put the full recommendation to all of council at that final deliberation meeting. Okay, uh, you said uh, earlier, Mr. Green, that uh, there's, an there's a choice to scale back and um, uh, tell me what would what would that look like and how would that work? We could, uh, what I would say rather than give off the top of the hand, I mean you could cut out the HVAC. You know, what was, was that cord? 500,000? We'll take that breakdown and we'll refine that for you. It wouldn't be options that we'd recommend, but these would be options that you could consider as a, co as a committee. Okay, so if if uh, at the end of today uh, we're going to refer a whole bunch of things back to staff for further information, if we added one that said something like uh, to provide further information on the council chamber renovation project, including a variety of options uh, for reduced costs, yeah. uh, you'd come back with 
yes. this version plus uh, some other stuff. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Grant? If we can add to that, my concern with having an a la carte menu, as it were, is that some things might affect different things. So if we could talk about how they're sort of holistically arranged, for instance, if we cut down HVAC, that might cause problems for the overheating of the electronic systems. And I think the electronics are important because, uh, full disclosure, my daughter watches our council meetings on YouTube. And, and so I know a lot of people do that. And right now, you're right. The, the um, uh, the ca closed captioning doesn't quite catch up to what's going on. So I, I would hate for us to sort of skimp on the closed captioning, close on, or skimp on any of the electronics uh, because we don't have the HVAC system because we decided we didn't want that on our a la carte menu. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we, I, I can assure you that we would not bring back options where excluding this was at the expense and not disclosing that. So what we bring you back will be quite fulsome. Um, I have uh, Mayor Burton and then I've got Councillor Elker again. On the exclusion of HVAC, I have to remind the committee and the members of council who are here that excluding fixing the HVAC will allow you to continue to complain during winter when the noise of the fans drowns you out and you complain about being cold. So, uh, you know, uh, let's try to Let's try to take uh, advantage of the uh, opportunity to improve something that not only benefits the people who sit on council, it benefits the people in the room in terms of their ability to be comfortable and to hear. Councillor Elgar? Yeah, um, uh, thank you very much. Just one other uh, question I have is regarding the, uh, the number of people and the 18-inch scenario. Is that still the calculation, the 18-inch scenario? 18 inches, yeah. Ontario building code uh, calculation. We got problems. I measured the uh, three firefighters that are with us today, and uh, we're going to have to cut 24 inches off between the three of them. They're in trouble. Yeah, it's like you're like it, 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 it's, it's not, it may be the minimum code, but it's not going to work anywhere I can find out. Um, and now, also on project number 42101701, Town Hall Major Accommodation Needs. A million one sixty one in twenty nineteen. Can we get the breakdown of what that sure. is, if you wouldn't mind? Too? Absolutely, I appreciate that. So, okay, uh, I thank you, Mayor Burton. I think you wanted to add on to this particular point, and then I, I will come over to Councillor Chisholm. I'd like to understand if the one hundred and fifty three one hundred and fifty three seats existing and the one hundred and fifty three seats proposed are both based on 18 inches, and I'm seeing nods of yes. So I conclude, do I conclude correctly that no matter how you measure it, the number of people accommodated, the space to accommodate people remains the same? Yes. Good enough for me, thanks. Uh, Councillor Chisholm. This uh, uh, revitalization of the court chambers if we weren't having the, the added uh, ward, would we be undertaking this major renovation? We certainly would. We would probably spread it over some time. Um, we have to replace HVAC. It's at end of life. <clears throat> um, we also have to, um, have to replace the IT infrastructure. It, too, is at end of life. And we will be doing, we always, we have an ongoing problem of AODA audits. And as I said, this room would not come up compliant. And when we do the audit, we would have to do the AODA um, repairs. This opportunity to close the council chamber um, has precipitated us putting them all together. So it would be safe to say the, the trigger for this was the addition to the uh, Ward 7 to make this happen. Yes. Um, our CAO, uh, Ray, Ray Green, articulated very well, and, and I thank him for that articulation. But what my concern is this, that when we look at this in, the, in our residence and our public view, is saying for whatever the cost of $2.2 million, that it's going to relate back to two seats of the Ward, ward 7. That's a concern of mine. Um, my understanding when we got into this, that was the trigger. That's what the, the, the design was supposed to encompass the, the two uh, seats for Ward 7. 
Now it's a bigger. So the messaging has to be recalibrated recal with respect to this totally. I, I, um, so that we're not on the on the shoulders of a ward of war, a new ward for 2.2 million. I'll just leave it as that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dudek. Thank you, um, and thank you for the presentation. I wonder, um, CAO Green, you had mentioned you'll bring back a fulsome report. I wonder if, similar to any of us, when we're sort of balancing whether or not we purchase something versus the repair costs. Can you give us some sort of ballpark figure in terms of what the cost we'd be looking at repairing either the HVAC or the audio system? Um, you know, I'm just thinking if it's piecemeal, similar to what uh, Commissioner Lalonde said, um, you sort of balance out, okay, are we throwing good money after bad? And should we look at biting the bullet and doing something sooner rather than later? <clears throat> I would hope that the factual information we give you in the report would lead you to a conclusion that you're comfortable with. And that's perhaps the best way I can put that. And if it leads you to the full project at 2.2, because you see the benefit, we have to change the narrative. I, I, I fully agree with that. That's why I was acknowledging. Perhaps when we put it all under that big umbrella, which seemed very simple to staff in a one-line budget, it worked. Hindsight's always a wonderful teacher. On the same token, if we broke it up into multiple, people would be saying, why well, you're not being open and transparent. So in the interest of open and transparent, we just talked about this room. But, and if council lands at believing a less money should be spent, I, excuse me, I would want you to have the facts that gets you to that conclusion that you would be comfortable with. Because at the end of the day, it is a decision of all of council. Any further? All right, any further? Okay, then thank you very much. I think we have dealt with that. Is there any other information that needs to be provided, Mr. Green or Ms. Sully? No? All right, then I think I just want to ask well, we how have made extensive notes for things to come back. Yeah, and, and I have as well, and I, I'm going to propose something to the committee uh, to help us move along. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to check. Councillor Elgar, you named a project code. It, was it 42101701? The um, Town Hall Major Accommodation Needs right. item? It's Thank you. The, the one going for it, so you want a multi-year, not just the uh, current year. Okay. Uh, very good. So, members of committee, uh, before we go further, I'm just going to double check that there are no members of the public here who wish to provide us with information today. Is that the case? Are there any members of the public here who wish to provide information? I don't see anybody. Very good. We have on the agenda seven items. Uh, the intent of the information is uh, really to refer the information to the December 12th uh, meeting to make decisions. There's a number of items here that are um, intended to pass, uh, for example, capital items and so forth. Uh, and so what I would like to suggest to you is that we receive the reports that are before us and that we direct staff to provide further information on a host of items that we've discussed. And uh, to make sure that I've captured it all, I'm going to read out the further items. And if I've missed something, please let me know and we will add it to the list. It starts with that staff report further on, uh, further for the December 12th budget committee meeting on a, the potential and impact to add Emily Carr Public School, Sunningdale Public School on Oxford and New Central Public School and McLaughlin a private school to the list of sites in the flashing 40 kilometer an hour zone assigned program. So that's a list of locations that people are interested in trying to add to. That staff report further on be the traffic signal optimization program with further detail. C, the potential to use dash cams on fire vehicles. D, the commission level budget figures for 2017 versus 2018. 
E, the top five capital projects by ward and a town map showing capital project locations. F, on extending the planting of trees on private property in conjunction with Oakville Green. G, the funding source for the pedestrian safety program. Uh, and for those who are interested, that relates to item number seven, where the funding source isn't named in the uh, staff report or in the staff recommendation. Uh, H, an updated list of priority shovel-ready projects for federal and provincial funding opportunities. That's something I spoke about the other day. I, the addition of a bocce court at Glen Ashen Park, also something I mentioned the other day. J, on gapped positions throughout the organization, and that's something that uh, Councillor Chisholm uh, spoke about the other day and was looking for information to show which departments have those positions and how they're being managed. Okay, further information on the council chamber project, including options for reduced costs. And I'm going to add now a uh, last item, which is information regarding project code 72101701 over multiple years. Is there anything else that needs to be added to this list? Is it exhaustive enough? <laughs> okay. Then uh, what I'd like to do then is have a motion to receive the presentations from the commissioners uh, and the uh, Recreation and Culture 2018 budget report from the Recreation and Culture Department be received, that the other items be referred to the, tw the December 12th uh, council, uh, sorry, the December 12th budget committee meeting and that the uh, information being requested as per my uh, reading out uh, be passed. Uh, Mayor Burton has moved that. All those in favor? Can we separate the receipt portion of the town hall? So, so Councillor Elgar, I'm not sure how to, um, well, we've received information from staff on it. Um, we need more. And we're asking for more. Uh, so I'm not sure how best to handle that because the information that we received is just information we're not I, I guess directing them. Okay so why so to be really clear then in the request that I made uh, for the information on the council chamber I wrote further information on the council chamber project including options for reduced costs and I can add to that if you'd like to help uh, clarify that. Um, options for reduced costs such as minimal costs to comply with AODA and the addition of two council spaces. Is that satisfactory? Okay. And Mayor Burton has moved that. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, good working with you on all of that. I appreciate all the input on the various items and pieces. If there is additional information that you would like subsequent to today, I'd like to hear about it so that we can get it to you in time for December 12th for that, that meeting. Okay? Thanks very much.